Ooh, the procedural officer. I'm the honourable chair, I believe. <laughs> yes, <Well>. you are. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> it's not always that I'm sure about my position, but such a good procedural officer. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us in our second virtual uh, meeting. Uh, I would like us to just quickly introduce us all. And can I start off with the, um, the honourable members, the full-time members of this committee? If you could just quickly uh, switch on your microphone and identify yourself, please. Deidre Bartman. Thank you. Are we going to do this in order of seniority? Uh, then you're certainly next, sir. <laughs> Peter Maria Freedom Frank. Good morning, Chairman. Good day, sir. And I've seen Honorable Maran. He's just been in a lengthy meeting, too. Yeah, uh, the Honorable Maran. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Chair. Thank you. Honorable Maseku. Are you on? She was also in a very long meeting which just ended. Thank you. Are there alternate members that are attending our meeting as well? None at this point. Thank you. And then I also wish to welcome our procedural officer, Ms. Shireen Nikerk. Thank you for the work that you, as well as our IT staff, has done to make this uh, meeting possible. Then also, can I uh, welcome the officials of the department? If you would be so kind just to introduce yourselves too. Thank you. Chair, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Mohane Sebopetsa, the head of department. And I'm going to ask my team to introduce themselves, starting with program one, and then um, and then we'll go to all the programs. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Doctor. Daryl Jacobs, if you can start. Sure, thank you. Daryl Jacobs, Deputy Director General. Thank you. Yeah. What is uh, Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairperson. Dirk Trotsky, responsible for business planning and strategy. Good afternoon, Chair. Rashida Wenzel, Chief Director, Operational Support Services. Ashia Peterson, Sustainable Resource Management. Good afternoon, Honorable. Good afternoon, Jim Caesar, Veterinary Services. Good afternoon, everyone, and the standing committee. Um, Ilse Troutman, Chief Director, Research. Good afternoon, members. Bongisoma Toti, Agricultural Economic Services. Is that the list? Uh, can I just, unfortunately, uh, I don't know if it was a bad connection, but uh, there was a gentleman introducing himself between uh, Mr. Gerald J Jacob Jacobs and Mr. Dirk Trotsky. If you would be so kind just to s introduce yourself again. That's Flores. Please can go ahead. Hello, Flores. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much then and, and welcome to you all. Uh, does that deal with the uh, members of the department? Can we then go over to our guests from Casidra? Good afternoon, Chair. I'm Pierre Chair, and I'm currently the CFO as well as the Acting uh, Chief Executive Officer, and the rest of the team will introduce themselves. Uh, good Can afternoon. You the name, sir. Can you please repeat? It's a very bad line. The Chief Executive Officer, who's that? The Chief Acting? Sale. Have you got good it? Freak, Freak van Seil, uh, Honorable Murray. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, uh, David Neff, Chief Officer Projects at Casidra. Good afternoon, members. Experience Matsi Diso, PR and Communications. Uh, good afternoon, members. My name is Masibong Silevu, Chief Officer Technical. 
Is that the list? Is there Thank any you, guests? Any guests that would like also to introduce uh, introduce themselves? Chair, we missed um, program eight. I mean, program eight. Uh, that last chapter is also in the meeting from the department. Thank you and, and welcome. I've just received an apology from the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, who has uh, indicated that due to personal circumstances, you will have to join us uh, late. Can I just say there's, a, there's, there's a, a lot of noise. I'm going to mute all and then just ask those members that uh, uh, when they present, that they just unmute them at that stage. Good. Thank you very much. Honourable members, we have on our, on our agenda today a briefing by the Department of Agriculture as well as CASIDRA on their five-year strategic plans starting with this financial year with specific reference to their strategic frameworks and their planned performance over this five-year period and the results-based management approach. And then we've also asked them to expand a little bit on the, the link between the different phases in the in the planning process as well as uh, the risks which they foresee and uh, and plans that they may have made to mitigate those those risks and uh, once we've had the presentations and i'm going to ask both entities to first present to us then there will be an opportunity to members to also uh, uh, put questions or make comments we will then also uh, uh, allow the, 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 our guests to leave if they so wish, and then we'll consider the uh, committee minutes as well as resolutions that members may want to propose. I trust that is in order with, with all of you. If so, I then would like to uh, go over and, and first um, welcome uh, Dr. Sebu Petsa from the department. Uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Sebu Petsa uh, we've noted that there are some new functions in uh, Microsoft Teams, such as the uh, option to, to indicate uh, when you want to say something by raising your hand. So uh, please use that, that function. And then also, uh, honorable members, if you would be so kind to keep your microphones on mute uh, uh, when you're not actively uh, participating. And also, uh, please, if you could switch on your video when you take part, uh, although that's not compulsory, and sometimes the quality of the uh, data connection might, uh, might require that you, you only unmute your microphone. And then also, um, I want to uh, uh, point out to you that uh, we are being live streamed on YouTube, and I've just had confirmation from a reporter who, uh, who indicated that the, the, the uh, YouTube streaming is uh, uh, working. And then if any of you should fall off and, and, and struggle to rejoin, uh, please contact our ICT staff who are on standby to, to assist where necessary. But uh, thank you very much again for being part of this meeting, for being present, although not uh, physically present. And uh, Dr. Sebu Petsa, I therefore would like uh, to give over to you to uh, start with a presentation on the strategic plan for the department. Chairperson, thank you very much for the opportunity. We always look forward to to come to the committee to brief you about the work we do. Wise to say that uh, the five year did not start very well. Um, obviously, COVID is our main challenge, but I think in the sector, we not only dealing with COVID, we also are dealing with drought um, because some regions in our province are still affected um, in a big way. And uh, Chairperson and the members would have heard the president announcing the stimulus package, I think, a few weeks ago. The implications of all that is that uh, there's likely going to be budget cuts in the current year. Uh, the quantum of which I think the CFO will give details in terms of what what is proposed, which obviously begin to say um, we may have to look at other ways um, of, 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 of getting resources uh, to be able to 
uh, to assist our farmers. Lastly, by way of uh, just making remarks, is the fact that we are yet to receive our funding uh, for this current year for farmers. You know, the conditional grant uh, funding that we always receive every year from up north, that has not come through. And um, as you can imagine, Chair, the farmers are, are getting um, anxious as to when this is going to happen. But from our side, we're doing everything we can um, to see the extent to which we can unlock whatever pressures they are up north. Quickly, Chair, in terms of our presentation, it's going to be a tech team. I've asked the Director of uh, Business Planning and Strategy to lead. Um, he'll do most of the presentation and he'll be followed by our finance man, the CFO. And then I'll come at the end. Um, and our plan, Chair, is to do it in less than 50 minutes if you agree with us. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Please proceed. Uh, would it be possible for you to also bring your presentation up on the screen? Yes, it's going to come up now. Uh, Derek Trusky, please go ahead. Thank you. I see Dr. Trusky. Chairperson, um, thank you very much for, for this opportunity. Um, I wonder, I, I think there's one or two people that whose mics are not uh, muted. I, I think that will help. Um, as, as the uh, as, as the HOD has indicated, the presentation will consist out of uh, four parts. Uh, I will co uh, cover the first two parts and then the CFO and the HOD will cover the last two parts. Um, in terms of, of the strategic plan, to a large extent, this is similar to what we've done the previous time, but we just want to recapture some of uh, the elements that is uh, that we discussed last time. So what we said when we developed our strategic plan is that we always must work in the environment of what we need to do. The mandate that has been received by the uh, by the uh, uh, politicians, uh, so at the national, provincial, and at the local government level. Then there's also our reality, uh, the reality what God gave us, or the cards that we've been dealt, um, and then there are a number of things that will prevent us from doing uh, what we have to do. So in terms of the cards that we've dealt, we've been dealt, We've got this uh, certain what we would like to call the en envelope of the possible, uh, the Western Cape. We've got a particular land uh, structure. Uh, there's water. We all know that the province or South Africa is relatively dry. And we've got a very specific climate. We've got a rainfall, a winter rainfall climate, which means that there are certain things that we cannot plant. We cannot do maize and sunflower and things like that without irrigation. And if we do it with irrigation, it has to compete with fruit and, and those type of products. So, so that is our envelope of, of the possible. Then we've got a, a particular human capital. Uh, we've got uh, 6,653 commercial farmers, 9,800 smallholder farmers, uh, 273,000 agri workers. And it's important that these agri-workers are more than a quarter, 26.2% of South, African, uh, South Africa's agri-workers are in the Western Cape province. Uh, we've got also 221,000 agri-processing workers. And what people tend to forget is that if we combine this, then more than 16% uh, of all employment opportunities in the Western Cape province is actually directly involved in agriculture. So anything that happens in agriculture has got a major impact on employment in, in the Western Cape province. Um, and then, of course, we've got our particular economic environment uh, in terms of markets, technology, capital, and those sort of things. So, so this is the reality that we have to work with. Um, then what we've got certain things that will prevent us on, on doing. Now, what's important here is that of the 10 risks that has been identified with the world by the World Economic Forum with the highest likelihood, uh, seven out of those 10 has got direct impact on agriculture. And in terms of the impact, there's another seven 
uh, uh, risks that is directly linked to agriculture. So agriculture is prone, is disaster prone uh, in, in this regard. And interestingly to note that one of those risks that has been identified was a spread of infectious diseases. Um, and we are here in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, so this is our risk environment. And they, when we did this, there were basically three that we've identified climate change, rural safety and security, and the fourth industrial revolution. That is very high on, on, on our agenda. In terms of what we need to do, the political environment, at the national level, there are seven medium term strategic framework priorities that was identified. And this is the national development uh, plan is being uh, linked down to these seven MTSF priorities for the next five years for implementation. At the provincial level, we've got the vision inspired priorities, uh, five vision inspired priorities. And we have got the minister's own priorities as well as uh, themes that seven themes that has been identified by local governments. Uh, this is part of the engagement with, uh, with local governments. These seven themes has, been, has emerged and they are of particular relevance to the Western Cape uh, Department of Agriculture. And all this we lead uh, better together. So what we need to do is there's a certain reality in which we need to operate. Then there are certain things preventing us from doing what we need to do. And this is then uh, uh, leading us to our strategic plan, which I will put the basics now on the, on the table. In terms of our strategic plan, we've got a, a, a vision, a transformed and sustainable agricultural sector ensuring food security and economic prosperity. Our impact statement is improved livelihood for all. Uh, some people say we are very ambitious, but we are saying what we are doing is within the agricultural context. We are working with improved livelihoods for all. And then we've identified four specific outcomes. The first outcome is increased agricultural production. The second is improved food security and safety. The third one is transformed and inclusive agricultural sector. And the fourth is innovative and resilient rural economies. Now, I've shown you that um, we have, when we operate, we have to work within the context of the mandate that was received at national, provincial, and in the local spheres of government. Um, and, to, and we did a, a rough calculation. There's 109 different act, outcomes that is being expected from us as a Department of Agriculture at the provincial level. So there's no way that we can focus on all 109. For that reason, we have developed our own log uh, logic or model of causality that we uh, are going to use over the next uh, five years. And this uh, model of causality, we say we need to start with our resources, the land, the water, the skills of our population, the capital in the economy, and all these is being combined into agricultural production. And, and, and that, is, that is what agricultural production is. How, how agricultural production is about combining these elements into a process, into a biological process to produce food and, and fiber. So uh, from agricultural production, usually there is the opportunity for uh, secondary agricultural production or value adding or agri-processing. But what is important to note is that all these products goes to the market. And uh, going to the market, it can either be in the form of primary agricultural production, in other words, your apples and your pears and your, your grapes that's being sent to the market, or secondary agricultural production, where it's the wine and the canned fruit that is being sent to the market. That market, in our case, is both export market and the domestic market. And we should never forget that in the Western Cape, about 66% of the value of agricultural production from the Western Cape gets in onto the export market. So the export market is very important for us. There's also a link between the export market and, and the domestic market. Um, now, if we talk about government objectives, um, economic growth can only take place 
from uh, if there's growth in the market, either from the, in the export market or on the domestic market. If, if more products are sold on the market, then we've got more growth. And this growth then also uh, feeds then back into the capital formation, into the capital market. Um, what we uh, should also remember, sorry, if I can just go back one. Uh, the other import, very important aspect is on household food security. And what we should never forget is that household food security can be from one of two sources. The one source is uh, from own production for own consumption. That is people in primary production doing household production, food gardens, uh, community food gardens. That, that is the own production. But the majority of the households in the Western Cape actually gets their products from the market. And that market can be either in, form, in terms of the formal market, in other words, where people buy from supermarkets or formal outlets, it can be in the form of informal markets, uh, which I will explain later is extremely important in our value chain, or it can be in the form of social markets, in the form of soup kitchens, food parcels, and those sort of things. That, that is where our household food security comes from, either from own production or in the form of uh, food being uh, sourced from some other uh, for, uh, component of, of the market. And finally, jobs can only come from increase in primary production or increase in secondary production. Um, to do this, we evidently have got a number of enablers. One is a safe and secure uh, rural environment. The second is a capable state in uh, doing what we need to do. Uh, and, and then, of course, we've got the uh, technology, innovation, fourth industrial revolution, etc. That all feeds into the skills component and into the capital, not necessarily the financial capital, but also in the knowledge capital that feeds into our production system. On the other side, it's important that we cannot, we can never forget about transformation. Transformation and the importance of women, youth and people with disabilities. And this is throughout the value chain, not only on primary production level, but throughout the value chain, transformation and, and uh, women and youth is important. Of course, what we do in the space also feeds back into the skills environment. In, in, when we focus on youth and training of youth, it adds to the skills uh, that we need for, for agricultural production. And finally, our biggest risk is in uh, climate change. Now, all this, if we look at uh, the importance is uh, our uh, Minister Mayer has got an apex priority in terms of market uh, de development. So that is in here, the rural safety priority of Minister Mayer is here. And in terms of VIP2, uh, uh, the key policy priorities are also identified in this model of causality. What is more important is in this model, we've identified 14 particular uh, areas where we can make an intervention. And for each of these interventions, we have developed a particular uh, a causality argument or a way, a logic, why we intend, why we've got certain interventions focusing on, on each of those. Um, for each of the sub outcomes, we've developed a number of sub outcomes. And these sub outcomes then link to that 14 particular elements that we've identified as part of the process. Uh, so I'm not going to go into the detail here. For, for these 14 uh, planning mechanisms, we have developed either a theory of change or a particular logic. And as an example, I'm only going to use one of these because otherwise we are going to spend too much time uh, discuss that. And I've used the example of black smaller business growth. So as a department in our strategic planning process, we've sat down and analyzed uh, the problem. And we've also brought in our uh, uh, stakeholders to be part of this, as well as our clients was part of the development of, of this process. Um, so the core in, in this case, the core problem that we've identified is limited business growth among blocks, black smallholder farmers. 
And we've identified a number of causes leading to this limited business growth. For instance, market forces, partnerships, lack of skills, access to technical services, etc. There's a whole range of, of uh, reasons why there is limited business growth. And evidently, this gives rise to low production, low turnover, uh, people remain smallholders, they don't create jobs, etc. So that's the consequences. So if we understand the problem, then how do we develop a process of uh, rectifying this problem? And what we've done is we said, okay, the theory of change, if we want smallholders to graduate to commercial, that is the final outcome that we want to achieve. We can then go back and say, okay, to graduate to commercial, there need to be increased turnover. For increased turnover, there need to be increased production. Uh, for increased production and increased turnover, farmers need to be more competitive. They need to be more sustainable. Um, for to be more competitive and increase production, we, the uh, productive capacity need to improve. They need to diversify. They have to focus on value addition. <clears throat> uh, to achieve this, they must be more efficient in the way that they combine these resources where we started. We started with water, capital, labor, those inputs, the way it is combined, they must be more efficient uh, in that. <clears throat> For better business management, they need, to, they need to be business compliance, they need to be improved market access, uh, the, uh, there's need for increased assets and infrastructure on farm. Uh, the certification processes that need to obtain will lead to improved market access. And to do uh, to, that brings us then back to particular actions that need to to be provided. So uh, for uh, increased assets and infrastructure on farm, the uh, ground finance can be provided. For uh, access to networks and partnerships, uh, coordinate and facilitate the partnerships and the linkages. We can provide advice to uh, provide the relevant knowledge, and that advice can be in the form of extension advisory services, the share program, framework of guidance for financial record keeping, etc. So there are a number of uh, actions that need to uh, that need to be taken for this whole process. So that then leads us then there are certain inputs, activities and outputs that can take place that will lead to certain outcomes. And in the process, we've identified a number of outputs for potential measurement. <coughs> outcomes for potential measurement. There are assumptions, there are certain risks that has been identified. And these uh, uh, outputs for potential measurement that indicators you will find that in our annual performance plan uh, on how we are going to measure the development of these. This is just some of our smallholder farmers who are en route from uh, smallholder to commercial. And you will see that some of them actually made a major contribution by donating some food recently uh, during this COVID-19 crisis. <clears throat> Not in all instances that we develop a theory of change, but we also use uh, evaluations from existing or new evaluations or other actions uh, in our planning process. I just want to stand a little bit also with the joint district approach. <clears throat> what is important is that uh, increasingly there's a requirement for a link between national, provincial and local government and the argument is that whatever happens must land within a particular environment and it needs, uh, there's, a, there's a requirement uh, at the district level. There need to be implementation pro, uh, plans. And you will remember that uh, from a national, or from, from a, a, a district approach, seven priorities was identified uh, where we need to focus. So those, we took those priorities, we identified a number of projects that we are going to run in this uh, uh, environment. And <clears throat> that indicators is an indication of how we are going to measure progress with each of these projects and each of these activities at uh, local government level. So that, that is our strategic plan. Um, and that was tabled earlier this year. 
uh, in March before COVID-19. And so COVID-19 is, is on the table. And the question is how will COVID-19, what will be the impact of that on our strategic plan? <clears throat> so when we talk about COVID-19, there are certain realities that, that we need to take to keep in mind. The first is that South Africa is a surplus producer of food. Our main exports is citrus, wine, table grapes, deciduous fruit, maize, beef, etc. And on the import side, our main imports is rice, poultry and wheat. Rice we cannot produce in South Africa and specifically not in the Western Cape, but poultry and wheat uh, uh, are also being produced uh, domestically. In the Western Cape specifically, we should never forget that although South Africa is a net importer of wheat, the Western Cape produce surplus wheat. So a lot of the wheat that we produce are actually consumed in the rest of the country. So if we kept all the wheat in the Western Cape, we would be able to, for, for each person in the province, to bake one bread per person per day. And I'm not talking about a steer's bun or something like that. I'm talking about a proper, a good bread. Apples, 118 kilograms, pears, 65 kilograms, grapes, wine, milk. So we literally live in a land of milk and honey uh, in, in, uh, in the Western Cape. However, <clears throat> what I have referred to is that we must always recognize that from the production to the consumer, this food value chain is complex. And if we start on the left hand side in terms of primary production, uh, a lot of the inputs that we, re that we need are actually, some of it is imported, but a lot of those inputs also come from other parts of the, the local economy. And recently, that was one of the major challenges that we've experienced uh, is procurement of these inputs in the medium and, and long term. So on the primary production side, there are some imported uh, uh, inputs, but also locally produced inputs. Uh, primary production leads, can lead to storage, ports, exports, or some of those goes to agri-processing, uh, through warehouses to distributors. And yet it is very important that we always remember that the formal retail and the informal trade is important uh, in the Western Cape, oh, for that matter in, in South Africa. Roughly 30, between 30 and 35 of, uh, percent of, of our agricultural products and our food gets traded via the informal market in our economy. Uh, the rest being, being traded through the formal retail sector uh, in normal years. What we also need to recognize is that the poor are our most vulnerable. Uh, the poorest part of our society spent 40% of household income on food, and the wealthiest spent 5% of household income on food. So what this means, any disruption, any increase in the price will have a, the biggest impact on the poorest part of our societies. And evidently, if the poorest part of our society lose income, they also lose the ability to purchase this food. Uh, so the, this is why the poorest part of our society are the most vulnerable. So what we've done is we've an analyzed what is the impact of COVID-19? What, what are the disruptors that we experience uh, currently or that we foresee that may be experienced? A lot of these disruptors is in international trade. For instance, bottlenecks at port, disruption of air traffic, um, importing countries to whom we export that say they have got other priorities at, at this stage. Uh, farm inefficiencies, inefficiencies abroad, etc. So there's a whole cluster of international. Then there's a whole cluster in terms of our value chains. Uh, disruption of value chains, social unrest, uh, we may also have a problem with on-farm outbreaks of COVID-19 in the value chain, the inability to import key inputs. And we've actually seen that happening where uh, at a certain stage, uh, we had certain problems with steel for tins that could not be imported, leading to problems in, in, in the value chain. 
Um, the lockdown uh, inefficiencies in the input supply chain uh, that we've experienced. Uh, the lockdown resulted in a lot of job losses. And as there was job losses, people that didn't have the income and because they didn't have the income, they could not purchase the food. Uh, that was another one. Weakening exchange rate has got a major impact, uh, particularly in for, uh, for those products that we are net importers of, like rice, but also in terms of inputs for the next harvest, uh, where there may, may be input. A slowdown, slowdown in South Africa's economy and in the global economy will have an uh, impact on, on the demand. Uh, there are changes in the consumer pattern. What, what consumers purchase are also changing, not only in, uh, uh, in, in the products, but also in the packaging. One, one of the consequences is, for instance, that uh, restaurants are closed. So because people can't go to restaurants, there's a decline in certain cuts, beef cuts, for instance, steaks that you would normally buy in a restaurant and not necessarily for home, co home consumption. So that changes in consumer pattern at, at the impact. Government failure, if government couldn't provide services, uh, the South African lockdown and the, Im the, the sequencing of this emergence from the lockdown, we have identified when we did this, and we can experience on a daily basis how this emergence from the lockdown uh, has got certain in, uh, impact. The inconsistency of the application of regulations uh, is also a major problem because what is experienced in a certain area, the police has got a different way of uh, applying these regulations than they may have in, in another area. So the impact of this what we've identified is uh, the impact of this disruptors. The first is a short-term shortage of goods on domestic markets. Now, our domestic supply of food are still intact. And the empty shelves we have seen was more the result of panic buying than of actual, uh, actual shortages. Uh, the only exception was certain high-value imported products uh, where uh, it, air freight and things like that was dis disruptive and we could not see uh, some of those products. To a large extent, that has been solved. We've got a long-term shortage of goods on the domestic markets. Uh, the, the, that is the potential impact. Uh, I explained about the weakening exchange rate. Uh, may have impact on the price of imported uh, product as, as well as the essential farming inputs. At this stage, uh, we have to monitor what is happening here because it may have an impact on next season's harvest and, and not yet. And then the food insecurity in vulnerable communities. Now, what we've seen hunger in these vulnerable communities is not due to the fact that there is not, the food is not available. But the problem is that people cannot access the food uh, due as a result of uh, job losses uh, and uh, uh, the, re, uh, uh, the fact that people don't necessarily have the ability to buy that product uh, has led to this job losses. And that's why direct interventions like food parcels is important, but also the supplementation of that by food vouchers, or coupons, or this additional cash uh, uh, payments that is going to vulnerable communities, because this enables people to access uh, the food. Um, other potential impacts of wasting of fresh produce. At this stage, we have not seen any wastage to, to a large extent. Um, of major concern is loss of market share abroad uh, because of uh, the wine producers that could not export for a lot, uh, some time. We are really concerned that they may have lost some of, of their share in, in the export market, and we will have to monitor that. A shortage of farming input uh, for that, and that is mainly for next year's season. Uh, and we have seen some anecdotal evidence that shortages of chemicals and equipment may be developing on the domestic market. Uh, and finally, there's the opportunity, or there's, there's the threat of failing farms. Uh, what we see if farms start failing it may have a major major impact. And the, the challenge is not individual farms. 
because as I indicated at the start, we've got about 6,800 commercial farmers and 9,000 smallholder farmers. So individual failing farms is not that big a concern. But when it becomes a trend and a large number of these farms fail, then we are sitting with a serious problem. So what we have done then is these seven impacts, uh, we are monitoring the status and uh, most of them are green. Uh, we are, our concern is with food insecurity in vulnerable communities and shortage of farming inputs. And that we are monitoring on a continuous basis. The, the next few slides is I want to show you is part of this monitoring process. And on a regular basis, uh, our agriculture economists in program six are monitoring what is happening on the export market as well as on, on the domestic market. So what we see is that in the case of table grapes and apples, uh, two of the four most uh, prominent export products from the Western Cape, we are basically following the normal trend. The oranges, the harvest has just started. Uh, we, there's a little bit of a, a problem and uh, we will see whether uh, the uh, harvest of origins, uh, origin, oranges will, form, will, will follow the normal trend as in previous year. Evidently bottled wine, uh, there is a big challenge in terms of bottle, bottled wine, uh, particularly on, uh, on the export market. The next four uh, export products, soft citrus, pears and lemons, uh, is, is basically uh, in the case of soft, soft, soft citrus and lemons, we are above the long term average. Pears are a little bit down from previous years. Uh, to a certain extent, that is still the impact of the drug that's being carried through to, uh, to on the production side. And again, bulk wine um, is way below the, the normal trend. In the Cape Town fresh produce market, and the Cape Town fresh produce market is still the biggest trading platform for fresh for vegetables uh, in the Western Cape. And we see if we look at potatoes, tomatoes, uh, and onions and butternuts, we see that it fluctuates around the norm. So there is no concern in terms of either the volume or the price of these products uh, that, that we should be worried about. In terms of uh, the food price inflation, I'm not quite sure for some other reason, pineapples, there's, there's a, a, a strong increase in the price of, of pineapples over the past couple of months. And I can only presume there's a new source for demand for pineapples that has been developed over the past few years. So there, there are a number of products where uh, there's an increase in the price. Uh, this data is straight from Stats SA that we can observe. But we should not only look at, the, at those uh, items where there's higher than normal demand for the product, but also for products where there's a uh, where there is a de uh, decline in, in, in the price. For instance, tomatoes, uh, margarine, sunflower oil, bacon, etc., is currently way lower than it was a year ago. If you look at the month on month, uh, February to March, uh, uh, change in price, we would see, for instance, beef, rum steak, mutton lamb, uh, those products that you typically would find in a more luxury environment or in restaurant there's a, a decline in the price for those products. And that is carried through to the, um, to, uh, uh, to the farmers. Uh, they experience this uh, decline in the prices also. We are working with the Bureau for Food and Agricultural uh, Policy that's a f uh, that do a food train uh, tracker. It's on a national level and they publish on a weekly basis, they publish this uh, publication and they monitor throughout the food value chain what are the challenges, uh, what need to be addressed, etc. This document is discussed at the national level um, in the agri uh, COVID-19 agriculture agricultural task team, and it provides inputs also there. And uh, these documents can be made available to the standing committee if, if they are interested. The chairperson, I'm very close to the end of my part of the presentation. Uh, I just want to talk briefly refer to the long-term impact of uh, COVID-19 on agriculture. And we've 
till now we've talked about the, the short term, but how will agriculture look like five or ten years from now? And if we, we, we do not have any certainty, but what we can do is we can use some scenarios to support us in terms of uh, the debate on, on, on future. Now, what we are clearly observing currently, globally, is that there's almost a reverse from uh, globalization, where people say in the past there was global value chains where uh, the cell phone that one has on, the, uh, on, on your table, part of that is being produced in uh, the microchips in China and throughout the world there are certain uh, products are being produced. We are currently sitting with the, with, uh, the problem that um, the, uh, this value chains do not operate as it would normally under normal uh, circumstances. And the question is, is this a short term impact or will it be a longer impact? I, I was fortunate last night, I actually attended a, a seminar on uh, COVID-19, post-COVID-19 strategies in African agriculture. Uh, and I was in Ghana actually last night, uh, uh, not by aeroplane, but but virtually. But what it, what comes out very strongly from this debate is the increasing emphasis on the agriculture as a domestic strategic uh, uh, sector of the economy, and looking at domestic solutions to food production and uh, that that type of of situation. So. Will we return to a situation where uh, our wine, our fruit, etc., gets consumed abroad, or will the focus more be on local production for local consumption? That's the one uncertainty. The other, uh, the other uncertainty is on the production side itself. To what extent will the pr production remain within traditional environment, or to what extent will we embrace the fourth industrial revolution? Uh, robotics and all those things that that take place. So based on this, we can probably develop four scenarios. The one scenario focus on local innovation, um, where new technology is used for local production into local areas. Uh, urban farming, this concept of uh, every person produce their own vegetables in the city, that, that type of production. The, the second scenario is one where it's more set in tradition. Uh, local production, but producing in, in the old ways. Third scenario is where one say, farm locally, mark globally. And in this instance, pro production like uh, organic farming, traditional practices will become more important. And those type of production products and production systems will have to be part of the marketing message uh, at an international level. And then finally, in terms of if we uh, compete in the global village and embrace the fourth industrial revolution and new technologies, we need to be at the forefront of new technologies. Uh, we have to be the light of the locomotive on the train, on the agricultural train uh, going around the globe. Um, in, for each of these, we evidently will have an impact on transformation, how we support our farmers, the type of extension that we do, employment, research, how we respond to climate change, the marketing support that, that we provide, etc. And we are currently in the process of unpacking these different focus areas. So, Chairperson, that is my part of the presentation. I'm going to give over to the CFO. Thank you very Thank much, you very Dr. Much, Dr. Can I Can also I just, just uh, welcome, welcome the Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Dr. Mayer, who has uh, also since joined us. Welcome, Doctor. And uh, thank you. We're looking. You, you want to say something quickly, uh, Dr. Mayer? You're most welcome. Uh, good afternoon, Chair. No, I will wait after the presentation, but thank you for accommodating me. You're welcome. And thank you. Is the, the CFO next? Yes, Chair, I'm just waiting to try and get, uh, get the presentation on. Um, 
the sharing at the moment doesn't allow me. Can Shireen perhaps help me somebody? Um, uh, Dirk, did you take yours off? Dirk is off. Yes, yes, I'm off. And your, your presentation as well, did you take it? My, my presentation is off. Uh, yeah, yeah, I still don't, don't have that access at the moment. <laughs> OK. Uh, you can put yours on. I can just say page if that will. OK, if, if let's, let's do it. Let's do it uh, that way. Uh, is this what we call remote control? Uh, that is remote control, Jim. Um, you can okay, proceed, thank you. Okay, you can still so that we can get to the numbers. Okay, thank you. That is, this is the first of four slides. Um, I think the opening remark here from uh, from me is uh, this budget, and, and we've given you last year's numbers, as well as the MTEF. Uh, we can't do it, obviously, for five years because we do not have it for five years. However, um, two things we need to bear in mind when we uh, uh, when we look at, at, at the budget as it stands is the first one is uh, this budget was uh, was done when we were not downgraded by Moody's to, to junk status as a, as a country. That's the one. The other one is obviously COVID-19 was also absent from this budget. Having said that, um, uh, we, uh, we already took a 5% cut from the previous year. And if we look at some of the comparatives, um, they uh, paint an interesting picture. Um, I just want to compare first uh, uh, the column for 2019-20 and 2020-21. Um, as I say, we took a 5% cut in terms of equitable share, and we took a between 10 and 36% cut on conditional grants. And then you will look at administration, you will see it grows from 129 to 140. However, there is a once-off um, um, earmarked allocation of 5 million, which which disturbs, uh, uh, distorts this a bit. However, you can see towards the end it actually works out. Sustainable resource management is an interesting one. Um, the 133 in the previous year, which looks more than 130 in the current year, was purely because of, uh, of a once of 50 million rand, which we got as um, section 25 uh, for, for drought. Uh, which obviously is not repeated. However, it's been replaced by about 49.5 million rand worth of works in terms of, of um, earmarked allocation again. Uh, Chair, farmer supported development is in terms of budget actually the the one that uh, that that uh, raises the eyebrows and make, makes us worry at the moment. And that is, you will see in 2019-20, it had a 311 million rand, nearly 312 million rand budget. It came down to 293, 681. Um, I've just referred to the conditional grants, which mostly lie in this area, that has been cut up to 36%. I think you can see the result here. Um, but it still looks better than it should because there's also a 20 million rand once of earmarked in that 293. So it actually, by implication, came down from 311 to 273 million. Veterinary Services Chair has, is, is a normal growth after the 5% uh, um, cut. Uh, Research and Technology looks, also looks a bit better than it should because it also has a 10 million rand uh, a once off earmarked allocation, which will not be repeated towards the end. And then we get to agricultural economics. And um, agricultural economics um, also has a 2 million rand uh, earmarked, but that, that is a carry through towards the end of the of the financial uh, or towards the end of the MTEF. Uh, Structured agricultural education and training, uh, that one goes down and the, the going down is very specifically because again of the conditional ground uh, grants that, that that went down and that amount was uh, um, 
uh, in terms of the cusp, and uh, so they had to go down and then they grow gradually again. Uh, chair rural development um, is, is a normal growth at the moment. All I can say is this, these amounts at this moment is perhaps specifically uh, from 21, 22 might be theory. Uh, as I say, when we start looking at, at specifically um, when we were downgraded, the cost of debt, we've heard that that has gone up and obviously that has to be taken down before National Treasury can again uh, uh, give us funding. So we expect cuts in this in this area. Uh, the chair at this moment, that is all I want to say about the, the budgets. Um, uh, uh, next slide, please, Dirk. Uh, Chair, thank you. Um, uh, we are now with the earmarked allocations, which are referred to in the in the first slide. Here we can see them um, for for what they are and the terms they ran, or they do run. Uh, there was a canal maintenance for uh, Lorva, that is lower Olifants River uh, um, canal system, of 3.5 million, going up to 6.7 million, and that will be with program two. Uh, ecological infrastructure, that is um, alien clearing and all those kind of things that they need to do specifically in rivers, etc. Um, that is also, uh, uh, you can see it's big amounts that uh, because this uh, this is rated as very, very important. And it starts with 21 million and going through to 37 million in the outer years. River protection works um, starts with 5 million and go to 11 or to, uh, to 15 million in the outer years. All three of these are in, in program two, a sustainable resource management. Uh, I did refer to program three, uh, that is the building of uh, a once off 20 million rand in the first year, 2021. Uh, cold storage rooms for black farmers in the Overberg. Three, it's three black farmers that will become the owners that are potential exporters, already exporters that will have their own facilities. Um, then we are at uh, program five. It's uh, market access. It's for market access. It's a biotechnology facility, uh, which we contribute to to uh, hot grow for, for which they do for the for the sector. Um, South African um, table grape, China market development. Uh, uh, that is the uh, two million right through for for program six. They, uh, Economists, the Brunfly Dam uh, raised the can canal wall by 30 centimeters. That is uh, a 20 million rand once off. Of that will also go to program two, and chair. And then we end up with uh, energy efficiency, solar and battery storage. That is at the head office at Elsenburg, two times five million rand. And if you think that we do have in excess of a 30 million rand account every year, uh, just here, um, you can see what that can help us in 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 in, in getting our cost down in terms of of ESCOM cost in particular. Um, Dirk, that's all I need there. Chair, okay, then we um, the HRD has referred earlier to the stimulus package that uh, the the um, that the president announced, and part of that stimulus package needs to be um, needs to be um, financed by reprioritizing the government budget. Now we got numbers from National Treasury adding up, and if you look at uh, the first two columns with red figures, the one totals 20.5 million, the other totals 34.37 million which adds up to 54.870 million or 5.7 of a uh, percent of our budget. Those are the amounts that a national treasury are actually requesting through our provincial treasury from the department as a contribution to uh, to fighting COVID-19. Uh, uh, In other words, it's a once off. Uh, we did not agree with how they got to the numbers. However, we gave them what we have here in front of us. Uh, we gave them that in the return, which adds up to the same amounts, but uh, it's the kind of thing that we actually can at least, um, that that we know how to uh, um, manage. 
and it starts and um, the very next slide, which I'm just going to talk to now, we will we, we'll go to that just after this one. Uh, the assumptions, um, uh, Dirk, no, you can go back. I'll just talk to it and then we can come back to this one. The assumptions are number one, all funding other than conditional grants can be surrendered. In other words, um, there are no uh, holy cows other than conditional grants. And the only reason, therefore, is because it's in terms of the Division of Revenue Act, uh, the department or the province can't change the conditions um, other than uh, uh, than working together with the national department giving the, the grant. So, and the second one is we also suggested that any savings or um, un, unspent uh, budget of the previous year should also perhaps go to uh, go to uh, the COVID-19 because it can lighten the weight on on the going forward. And then you will see I have red numbers right to the left just to uh, explain where they came from. The first one is contractors and that we, uh, on, we uh, say we can save their 4 million rand and that is actually directly due to the lockdown, uh, the time lost during lockdown. Um, I'm just talking on the first two at the moment. Uh, the, the third column is only the previous year funding. In, in other words, that is what was saved and uh, uh, that can't be changed. Then we go to number four, property payments. We say with uh, introducing the batteries, et cetera, we can, uh, uh, we can save 4.5 million uh, uh, this year uh, by, by, in other words, uh, uh, putting in batteries, et cetera, and not uh, pulling everything directly from, from ESCOM. Traveler subsistence chair, all international trips were cancelled. We, we cancelled. Half of the domestic flights and accommodation are also cancelled. Uh, all of this due to lockdown and that we are at the moment on an international, um, well, not flying anywhere. The, the bit of money that was left over, it was purely just to, to complete previous year's expenditure. Um, chair then at number five, uh, oh sorry, that was five, number six, training and development um, uh, to be surrendered due to lockdown time, uh, time lost, um, and seven venues and facilities, uh, uh, Chair, uh, I wrote here most, if not all events like the agri-worker competition and the female, fa uh, female entrepreneur competition, are uh, most probably not to happen this year because of lockdown and, and restricted movement. Um, uh, the prior competition issues cannot be dealt with. And, uh, and for that reason, we, we say we will definitely also be able to save on that. Chair, then we get to the transfers. As uh, number eight, the river protection work can only be done in summer. The lockdown has caused pre-winter summer to be lost. In other words, since March and up and until the end of this month, uh, nothing could really be done. So we missed that time, and it can't be it can't be uh, caught up. So we say that this is the kind of money that we, the three million rand, we will not be able to spend anymore this year. And chair, then uh, number nine, the non-profit institutions. There are three of them. The Clan William Dam Canal maintenance is only possible before winter when the dam level is at its lowest. The opportunity was lost due to lockdown for 2020. That's three and a half million. Then the second one under nine is too much time was lost to spend more than half of the funding other to be spent within financial year for cold storage rooms for black producers. In other words, we will most probably be asking for the, we got 20 million. We say we can spend 10 and hopefully we can ask for the next 10 to be transferred to the, to the following year. Uh, the, the very third and last one, Chair, on nine is the increasing, increasing the height of the canal wall of the Brandfly Dam is a legal dispute with the Department of Water and Sanitation. Uh, we do not see this to be resolved in time to spend the funds for this year, and we hope that we can also ask for that to be um, introduced in the following year. Chair, chair these two add up to 54.870 uh, million rand. Should we add a surplus of, of, of the previous year, it can go up to 70.670 million rand. Uh, Chair, it's 5.7% of our current budget. Uh, Chair, that will bring us to the last one, which I've discussed mostly, but if we can just, uh, the last, um, uh, Dirk, please, the last um, uh, slide now. 
it should uh, it should show it 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 doesn't show with me at the moment i'm not sure about the rest uh, chair yes, do you do see that do you see that narrative assumptions, assumptions and motivations yes yes we okay. do see I don't it see if you've got it in print form it me, but, but if you do see it it's lovely i'll talk to it uh and say the funding in the control can be surrendered Chair, yeah, I actually went through all of this, uh, perhaps in the in the in the uh, interest of time. Um, I can just end up by saying at the bottom, which I, I uh, put in bold is the general is that the original suggested numbers were discarded. From National Treasury as the assumptions did not make sense to us. However, the requested or suggested amount was met. Uh, Chair, I can just say uh, these figures at this moment are still shall I say theory, because we did not get confirmation yet from, from Treasury whether they're going to take it or not. We expect it, however, before uh, Minister Mueni will do his uh, 25 June uh, uh, budget speech. Thank you, Chair, from my side. Thank you, Mr. Heisamer. Uh, Dr. Sebu Fetsa, is there anything that you would like to add at this stage? Chair, thank you very much, and I want to apologize. I think I taken more time than I promised. And I want to summarize the rest of the slides with the following five points, and uh, wish to indicate to you, Chair, and the members that um, each program could be invited at any time uh, to brief the committee in terms of the details. But at high level, that all our contact events um, uh, on hold whilst we are looking at other options to still host some of them. Uh, but also the fact that COVID had launched or, or, or if you like, plunged all of us into remote working. Um, and what we've been doing, I think, since um, the first day of the lockdown, we had decongregated our, all our buildings and put in place a rotational um, work system where upon uh, uh, not all officials were expected to uh, to come to work. Uh, fourthly, that also at Elsenberg we had put in place an e-learning um, uh, uh, system uh, to the extent that all our students uh, continue to benefit from uh, uh, lessons and assessments um, as, as, as we are in, in, in the lockdown. But I think that's all I wanted to indicate, Chair, uh, in the interest of time, but also to reiterate we are able to come to the committee uh, uh, as individual programs to come to the committee. Chair, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sebu Petsa. And if you could just uh, mute yourself, unfortunately, there is some noise on your microphone. And I do hope that your IT department would be able to resolve that uh, before the next uh, meeting. Uh, then, um, can I say, Minister Mayer, can we go straight on to the uh, presentation from Casidra, or would you like to come in now? Uh, Chairperson, uh, you, it's, uh, shall I make a few comments, or would you like uh, Casidra to proceed? Uh, it's as you would be able to stay now until the end of the uh, meeting. So if so, then I would uh, like us first to deal with the uh, with the presentations. And then perhaps if you would be willing to uh, write at the end of our meeting, uh, share your thoughts with us. Is that in order? Yes, sir. that is in order. Thank you very much. Then I want to welcome Mr. Frick van Seil. Uh, and, and please, Mr. Van Sel, if you could proceed with your presentation, I trust that you will also be able to bring this up uh, on our screen so that we can follow. Yes, Chair, we are busy. Um, there we are. Can you see it, Chair? Yes, thank you. You can proceed. Right. Thank you. Um, just to start by saying um, the Department of Agriculture Western Cape is our uh, mother department. Um, our executive authority is Dr. Ivan Mayer. Uh, the accounting authority is 
our board of directors, and we have currently nine directors on board. Management team, we've got eight managers. Our reason for the reason for our existence was determined by the provincial government, uh, Western Cape, during 19, 20, 2007. And the mandate was approved as agriculture and economic development within a rural and land reform context. It is wide enough, I believe, to allow us to do our work. Who are we? Um, Casidra is a 3D provincial government business enterprise. And in terms of the Companies Act, we are a SOC state-owned company. We are very proud of our 30-year record as far as audits are concerned. And at the last um, bullet there, we is also, Casidra is also registered with the National Credit Regulator. That means we are allowed to do banking transactions. In the middle part, we are a team of professionals and we are partner in project execution and delivery. And one of our characteristics is modesty. So therefore we put in a few adjectives there as well. Our purpose, the vision, to be the catalyst for growth towards self-sustainable um, uh, sustainable communities. Our mission is to maximize agriculture and economic development opportunities. And our deliverable is to deliver project management excellence for our key partners and our clients. Our business diagram, Casidra has got four legs. The one to the far right is the corporate support services uh, focused internally and to do the, um, the finance, the HR and the public relations. The first leg on, le on the left hand side is agriculture and land reform. Then we've got the rural infrastructure development and poverty alleviation. And our program four is local, local economic and business development. Um, we've divided in, in, our, in the first one, the project management, where we do handle the ma management of government farms. There's also the farmer support development initiatives and the food security projects. Then as far as agri-technical agri and land reform advisory, it is crop development and project implementation, disaster management and funding and training development and land reform, the LRA desk. Under local economic development, we've got small, medium and micro support for businesses. Also business advisory desk and the loan fund. And we are currently looking at ways to cooperate with the UIF fund as well. Our strategic uh, priorities is, and I'm taking just keywords, is in the first one, management um, excellence. And the second one, it is the sustainable management of the remaining two farms. Then we've got facilitation and land for the land reform. Mm -hmm. It is also the growth um, of the funding and the revenue for, um, uh, for, the, for through uh, partnerships that we are looking at in the next few years to see whether that can be sustainable. It is the economic development and green economy, pro economy projects, and then also to main maintain our project management center. Our strategic uh, orientated goals is in the first sentence, project management. In the second one, local economic and business development. It's also the management of the, um, it's good governance, good corporate governance. It is uh, to develop and implement Casidra's development model and project management at number five, and then develop new markets um, with com commercial partnerships. We've also linked in with, the, with six of the government national priorities according to the framework. And for the provincial framework, we've identified five priorities there. And as far as the ministerial key priorities, we've also identified um, the five of them. And our success stories, um, during at March 2010, we've handed over the farm Jakob's Kral. It's a dairy farm near Kranz, uh, just outside Kranzhoek in the Pletonberg Bay area. And then also last year, the Arnold Boerderij apples 
um, near um, in Harlem near Arnold. Then currently, um, the as far as the management of the of Vicral and the Malenstein, the government farms are concerned, um, we are actually a caretaker currently due to various reasons. And one of the main concerns for the board uh, is, general, uh, is the sustainability of these two farms. During the last couple of years, specifically from 2016 onwards, uh, it is the continuous drought at the farms that is one of the main um, uh, uh, stumbling blocks. And then also um, the, the handing over of the farms is priority, but there are always things that prohibiting us from doing that because we want to hand over a sustainable farm um, and the funding for the farms and the water are the main um, are the main concerns in that regard. Then we continue um, our experience and uh, challenges are the, um, the monitoring, the facilitation and the coordinating of our programs. We give entrepreneurial support uh, for the land reform project. It is also to get access to local markets and then a multicultural approach with both public and private sector. In our own processes, we complete our strategic plan following annually. It's been updated by in the corporate plan. We do our budgets annually as well, revise the annual budgets. It is the, then the implementing and the monitoring of our actions. And then we do court, uh, reporting against that. And then the final one is the reporting in the annual report. As far as the budgets are concerned, it is annually the um, guidelines from Treasury, the economic climate, and also the financial climate in the country that is guiding that. Our risks. Um, is always budget constraints and then also we've already heard that the implementation of national projects will um, the funding for the Western Cape will be revised and that will definitely impact on us. From the project side, it is again the, the drought situation at the farms and then also the 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 scarce, the scarce of the water that that's lacking at the farms the dams and then also the funding because we've submitted a few um, plans but it, it was long-term plans and the challenge is to get the funding to do the implementation or the capital expenditure um, and therefore you need a lot of money up front. We also identified uh, the COVID-19 as a, as a um, we put it on as a risk and it is now the managing thereof we were classified or did essential services for agriculture and therefore we could on a limited scale continue with our businesses and we also already started with the um with the level four unlocking um, of our activities I, uh, we, I, I want to end off by saying that if you told me two or three months ago that COVID 19 will have such an effect on us on the country on the world I would not believe you, but then because um, of we all we managed the process so far and that the things that seems impossible is actually been done. That in a nutshell chair is our presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Van Seil. Uh, Dr. Mayer, would you like to come in with a few remarks before we give over to the members for comments and questions? Uh, Yes, uh, Chair, I think I will do that. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, yes, Chair, thank you uh, uh, for uh, the opportunity to make a few general uh, comments uh, on this proposal. And uh, thank you for allowing me to join you later. I just at an appointment here at Cape Gate Hospital. Uh, firstly, Chair, I think uh, we have done the uh, analysis of the impact of COVID-19 on agriculture, but this is uh, an updated draft and on a regular basis, uh, the team will update the uh, presentation uh, that Dr. 
Trotsky and the team has made because as we are experiencing COVID-19 is on a daily basis, different things happening. But I think this update of the impact of COVID-19 on the agricultural sector gives us an insight of what we can expect. Uh, we have also uh, prepared a briefing paper in this particular regard, particularly for the sector. Uh, we have also, as they have indicated on a regular basis, it is important that we on a regular basis also consult with the agricultural sector. This has also taken place. Uh, I'm also setting up another meeting with all the agricultural stakeholders, as well as with the Western Cape Prestige Agricultures Workers Forum. My office is currently setting up that engagement. I have also uh, chair and members of the standing committee. I've asked the head of the department, Dr. Seppo Petza, uh, last week uh, to arrange also a post COVID-19 summit on agriculture so that we fully understand the impact of it, but with the stakeholders so that we can also get ourselves ready for the next 10 to 15 years, because as we know, uh, COVID-19 will not have only a one or a two year impact. It have, will definitely have an impact on the agriculture for the next decade year in the Western Cape. Uh, we must also remember that agriculture will change both locally and globally. And we know, Chair, that the Northern Hemisphere, our main export markets have been hit more severely in terms of COVID-19 than us. And therefore, I think there's also a great opportunity for us in terms of uh, exporting to that particular area. So uh, many people in Europe, particularly uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, even in Italy, Spain, uh, as well as Germany in these countries in France, they were hit very hard. And I think we can expect that we may have a greater opportunity also to get into those markets. I think we must also uh, position ourselves for the next wave of agricultural production. I think the committee will recall that the previous time we have I look, uh, mentioned to the committee that I think in 2018, the Western Cape Agriculture It seems to me as if we may have lost connection with Dr. Meyer. Do you hear me? Yes, Chair. Um. Good. It seems to me uh, the, the problem may be on his side. Honorable members, can I then ask that uh, you indicate whether you would like to ask questions? My comments by raising your hand. Can you hear me? Raise my hand, Mr. Chair. Uh, sorry, Dr. Mayer. Yes, uh, we we missed we we lost connection with you for a, a minute or three. Uh, Can I proceed? I'm, I'm not. Yes, please. But I'm not sure if I would be able to say exactly where we we lost you. If you could go back, as I've said, about two three minutes. Okay. I think, uh, Chair. Uh, I think what we see is the. The demand for agricultural production, I think, will increase in the northern hemisphere, given what we have seen in terms of the impact of COVID-19 in that part of the world. Uh, I think the committee is also aware that our agricultural value production in 2018 was about 43 billion rand. And we're uh, watching this particular very closely. I think in the uh, short to medium term, we will see a potential a drop in agricultural value production, but we certainly We'll come back to the committee on those particular details. But what we are seeing, Chair, is that our agriculture in the Western Cape is very resilient. We still have the impact of the drought, and therefore we have also made, uh, because of our last year's budget, we, there was a 10 million rand earmarked allocation under sustainable resource management for the drought. We have been allocating this money since the beginning of last month. Uh, so we are particularly happy that we were able to, while people are still having the consequences of COVID-19, that we are still able also to make a contribution uh, to the agricultural community, specifically uh, in the regions that were severely hit by the drought. 
Also, uh, Chair, I think this uh, presentation by our CFO that indicates that there will be about a 36% uh, cut in the conditional grant is massive, and it will certainly have an implication on the budget as we go forward. Uh, also, I have also asked the HOD, I think last week, I did communicate with him to ask him that we must look in every single program of the Department of Agriculture to look at five new innovative things that they can come up with in the various programs, because I think we are now living in the 21st century knowledge economy, uh, in the uh, fourth industrial revolution that require all of us to be a little bit much more innovative than we were uh, before. So that work is still continuing. Uh, I think what is important is that the work, despite the COVID-19 is continuing, the HOD did consult with me, uh, given the work that needs to happen in terms of the extension officers. He has indicated to me that he has taken a decision to limit it in terms of social distances, but they are in the field supporting the agricultural community. I think we are going to see in all different fields, but particularly in agriculture, new greater opportunities. And as we often say, don't waste a good crisis. And I can assure you, the Department of Agriculture will certainly not waste the crisis. I think what we see from Dr. Trotsky's presentation is also the scenarios of being traditional versus modern, the scenario of being local versus global, and we are still unpacking many of these uh, particular scenarios uh, for agriculture. So I still have a vision, and perhaps more so now, uh, that we must have more agricultural schools in the Western Cape. We had a meeting last year, the end of last year, with our colleagues from the education department. That's the vision that I still have that we must get more of the youth involved in agriculture. And I can understand, and the chair, I think the committee must know that all the various departments are under enormous budget pressure and stress, but I will certainly continue fighting for more money in the cabinet for agricultural schools. Because I think what we, where we are now, we are now right in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution even on this particular platform using this type of technology tells us that we must make and prepare ourselves for a longer term impact of COVID-19. And I think the youth, and particularly the youth are more uh, compatible, if I can use that word, uh, with this uh, fourth industrial revolution technology, and perhaps we can get more of the youth also involved uh, in the medium to long term uh, in this particular field. So. I think, Chair, I think this is a difficult time for agriculture, particularly given the fact that the agriculture was defined as a, an essential service. And I think the department, while we're dealing with the current crisis, uh, in terms of COVID-19, we also have to have a forward-looking perspective and that work and planning is already taking place. In addition, Chair, we are also going to look into having some webinars we're also going to look into having some online events. Uh, you will are aware, Chair, that the Agri Expo already had the South African Cheese Festival online, and we have many agricultural information days, and maybe we should also be going into that direction uh, in terms of the agriculture for the future. I think agriculture for the future has now been accelerated by COVID-19. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister. Uh, honourable members, now over to you. I did hear Honourable Marais voice. Uh, it seems you indicated that you would like to speak. Honourable Marais, you're welcome. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Speaker, Chairman. I'm, I'm, I'm very deeply concerned about what I've heard up till now. Very, very concerned. You know, Casidra has been now in the making since 2007. And I, this report, I think I'm, I say, saw it a couple of times. It's the same report, the same klachtes, uh, oh, die droogte, oh, die infrastructuur is hier daar nie. 
kapasiteit is hier daar niet, ons het die geld niet. Hulle is het ook klomp mooners. En ik wil nog voor u vragen, het ons rechtig gesiedere nodig? En honestly, hoe is strategically uh, responsible to set up gesiedere's scorecard? Wie merk hulle boeken? Of merk hulle hulle self? Jy weet, as ek, as, as, as ek nou uh, examen schrijf, dan is het iemand anders, buitenstaanders, wat het merkt en sê, hoe goed het ek gedoen? Wie merkt hulle performance? I'm not happy. Do they have a, a dashboard uh, to monitor and track their key performances? Where is the dashboard? Who does their ratings? And I'm concerned that they now talk about what their limitations are. After all these years, they come to us with limitations and they say, we don't have the capacity for we don't have the project management resources, which is limited. The practical implementation of projects in rural areas, they say are limited. They say their ability to move quickly and adapt to regulations is a problem. They say that the reporting and compliance requirements is also problematic. Now, as a little clock goes is, in hulle klaar gedierig, dan vraag ek, wat de nut is Kesidra vir hierdie departement om nieuwe opkomende boere te bemachtig? Wan gaan ons een verslag kry van die name van boere wat nou al bemachtig is? Wat nou al productief is? Wat hem, hoe reeds de maturity rate in terms of agriculture? I want to see that. I want to see a list. He is Piet Pompis of he is Mr. Ungulwana. He is a successful farmer. He's come through our process. We've trained him and everything. He's been capacitated. Waar is daar die list? Ik wil hier hoor van een dam wat 30 centimeter nog gaan gelig word nie. En dan hoor ek ook hulle sê, we, we haven't spoken. We've got savings which we will uh, uh, give back. What are you talking about? Did, did you examine the culture of the people who you train to be farmers? Do they have the, the, the proper working culture? Uh, the type of thing that you want them to do. Are they capable of being trained to do it? Uh, we want to see results. Mr. Speaker, I'm sorry to, to be long-winded, but Cassidra has been before our committee now several times. I yet have to see a success story. I yet have to see them taking us to a project and saying, there's the apples, there's the oranges, come and see the lettuce, which is produced on a farm which we have managed. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. And I want to tell you the tangibles, which they say here, have, if they have identified the problems, they must come with a solution. We're not farmers. It's no use coming to tell us your problems. We can't solve your problems. All we can do is give you money. You have the plans, show us results. And if you don't have results, we're going to get rid of Cassidra, sir. Thank you, Honorable Bure. Uh, Honorable Marie spoke Afrikaans from time to time, but I do believe that most of what he has said in Afrikaans, he has repeated in English. Is there anybody that believes that they would like uh, a, a brief translation of what he has said in Afrikaans? Jefferson, I'm, I'm covered. Are you covered, uh, Dr. Sebuse? Yes, yes, I am, Chair. You're covered. Good. Yes. Thank you very much. And we will give Cassidra and yourself an opportunity to respond later. Are there any other members that would like to ask a question or make uh, some comments at this point in time? And Dr. Sebu Petsa, if you would be so kind to mute your microphone again, please. Thank you. Any see other members? Can you see that my hand is up?
Sorry, the list is quite long, so I didn't see your hand. Yes, I, I see both of you. Thank you, Honorable Bartman, and then Honorable Maran. Chair, I think Honorable Maran was before me. Honorable Maran? No, you can speak, Chair. Let's first. Okay, thank you. Chairperson, um, I want to refer to the slide where um, it was indicated that pineapple prices have increased by 20.83% in the past month. I think it is slide 33. And the first part of my question, I just want to find out, is this related to people in lockdown due to the alcohol ban making pineapple beer in their homes? That's the first part. And second of all, I actually want to find out what innovation can one put in place because of the new um, pineapple beer craze? For example, is it not possible that when lockdown is over that those persons who can make good pineapple beer are able to apply for funding to start up their own pineapple beer enterprises, for example, um, and it might um, even become a new market? The third part of that is, how is the alcohol ban at the moment, including the making of and selling of pineapple beer, currently eating into other alcohol markets within the Western Cape? Thank you. Thank you. Honourable Mara. Chair, uh, thanks. And again, good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon, Minister. Um, Chair, can you hear me? We hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Chair, first, let me let me welcome um, this project plan or update, as been called by the by the minister. Uh, also, minister, um, when you say that you want to fight for more money for the province, um, for the province to get their fair share. You got my full support. But also, Minister, during this period, farm workers, vulnerable farm workers, and also those uh, whose food security has been threatened, need your support, not during this lockdown, but throughout. I'm saying this, uh, uh, Minister, because what we have seen now during the lockdown period is more and more farmers coming forward providing food for those who are in need of food, those who got excess food. But I think last year, during a report from the Agricultural Department, the then HID informed us that at least 40%, 14% of the province uh, 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 residents go hunger on a daily basis. Now, what we've seen now during the lockdown period and the assistance from farmers from farmers is basically what we want to see even beyond the lockdown period. When there's excess food that they provide for those who are in need of food. Minister, quickly, the 10 million rent that, that's been made available for drought support. February, when we visited the, the, the Caro in some of the garden root areas. We've been told that, that the 50 million rand that was made available for drought support was only for, 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 for livestock farmers. And I can remember, Chairperson, at that stage we are saying drought is drought. Whether it's a fruit farmer, whether it's a vegetable farmer, drought is drought. And whether this 10 million rand that's been made available for drought support whether again it's only for uh, uh, livestock farmers or does it include also other farmers when it's uh, fruit or, 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 or also vegetables? Chair, I'm not sure when, whether you're going to give a second round because I got some more issues that I wanted to ask. Can I continue? You're welcome to continue. Chair, thanks. I just wanted to check with, uh, and I think Cassidra can also come in here, Chair. I think there's a program that speaks to, and I'm not sure whether the total is correct, 50 uh, small or little farmers that they want to turn into commercial farmers, uh, Chair. And, 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 and again, if we have listened to the 
presentation of the Department of Agriculture, there's a few boxes that they need to tick off. I just wanted to check, Chair, in terms of within this lockdown period, uh, that particular program, how it's been affected, if it's indeed affected, uh, and, and obvious, if it's been affected, it will, it will be affected negatively. I just wanted to check in terms of that particular program, Chair. The, the issue of um, pineapples, because the presenter earlier on said there was a, uh, a pineapples, Chair, and, and, and uh, the uh, and I wanted to ask the minister maybe whether he knows why there is such a demand, increase of demand when it comes to pineapples, but the Honourable um, uh, Bartman have answered my questions and she concluded that it's pineapple beer. I'm not sure whether it's true. And then also, Chair, the minister, last year, remember last year when you started our term, one of your visions, and, I'm, and I wanted to check with you because Earlier, uh, during the, the, the presentation, we have heard, for instance, now your, your beef and your steaks, uh, the, the restaurants that closed, there's, 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 there's a, the, the demand is not that big anymore. So uh, your abattoir, provincial abattoir and the export market, and I think it was the, the, the Muslim market, uh, uh, whether the vision is still there and if Chair, where they have started, if not, when? Chair, thanks. Thank you. Are there any other members in the meeting that would like to participate? If not, I'm going to hand over to the uh, officials and to Minister to respond. Uh, yes, Chair, thank you very much. I will start first and then Dr. Sebo Petsa will then... Uh, field some of the question and also refer some to some of our senior managers. I think, uh, firstly, let me defend Casidra as the state-owned company. For the last 30 years, it has a clean audit. I think they have good governance systems in place. And I'm very proud of the track record and the work that they are doing. This does not mean that we do not have issues. In fact, we do. Sorry, it seems as if we've lost Dr. Mayer again. Uh, could I ask then Dr. Sebu Petsa, would you mind continuing where he has left off? Yes, Chair. Um, I, I, I want to start with uh, one. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, um, the Casidra issue, I want to reiterate what Minister was, was saying, that indeed to say there are no successes, um, emanating from the work that Casidra is doing um, would not be correct in terms of what we know. And uh, uh, I would immediately want to ask, Chair, that maybe the land reform reports that were done uh, by the department in the last 10 years, uh, that maybe you allow us space to share with the committee in terms of the excellent work uh, that had come through. And our view is that we would not have achieved all those successes as a department on our own without the, the, the good work uh, that Casidra is doing. But of course, there's a challenge when it comes to state farm. It must be understood, Chair, that uh, these farms... Yeah. Chair... Chairperson, you're welcome. Can I can I go on? Yes, please. Yeah, please it, it must also be understood that these these are state farms, and uh, obviously the mandate <clears throat> was given to the department, um, um, and we, we we ask Casidra to manage them. And, and th these farms belong uh, to to national government, and unless there is funding coming through from those channels, it becomes. Uh, very, very difficult. Suffice to say, in the last while, the department continued uh, to support these farms, and we agree with Casidra that these farms cannot be handed to those communities uh, unless they are viable. Uh, and, and we go on, we continue to engage national around these matters um, that relate to um, to the to the government farms. I've asked them to respond to the issue of pineapple prices and also the 
the alcohol related uh, related issues honorable uh, meren the the issue you raised around the smallholder farmers i want to say that um, there's not been um, any negative uh, effect in terms of the work that we wanted to do you would also remember that agriculture had not closed so from day one <clears throat> we had a number of our people uh, supporting this project including casidra whom we had issued uh, the permits to conduct uh, uh, their work as part of of um, uh, essential uh, services so and uh, i'll ask daniel or asia to respond to the question around um, the drought the fact that it's only limited to livestock and i think uh, daniel or asia will go into details around the legal framework um, and that talks to that and i think the question around the the support from the industry for farm workers uh, that that was a, it's a it's a it's something that is noble we comment what the industry has been doing and by the way they continue to support the the humanitarian relief project across uh, the province and we we commend uh, the industry for that i'm also aware that minister had communicated with the industry formally in terms of uh, one encouraging them uh, but also thanking them for, for the work that they they continue uh, to do in the space honorable chair i want to hand over to derek uh, to deal with the pineapple and the alcohol related issues will be followed by darrell uh, jacobs on the drought issues thank you chair thank uh, you mr trotsky will you will you deal with the alcohol problem <laughs> I don't know if it's an alcohol problem or an alcohol opportunity. Um, I, I, when I showed this slide, I was very much stung in the cheek because I, I can't really think of another reason why there's suddenly such a big demand in, uh, in pineapples and why it would lead to a price increase. Um, I would just want to caution one thing, and that is that the figures I've shown is actually only up till, it's only for March. So the April figures are not available yet, and the April figures may actually show a bigger increase uh, in 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 the demand for pineapples uh, as as we as we proceed. So yes, I, I think there's very much a correlation between the lockdown on on, on alcohol and and demand for for pineapples. Um, over the longer term. Is, is there opportunities? I think yes, but not only limited to, to alcohol. We've, we've actually seen it over a number of years now, in the sense, if we look at what is happening in the craft beer market, if we're seeing what's happening in the gin market, there's, there is an, a major demand for artisanal products and homemade products. Uh, so I, I think there will be definitely a demand for these type of products going forward, not only from apples, but Vitblitz, Mampur, and other brews that, that, that may develop. Uh, so this is, an, this is an opportunity for innovative people. However, I, I want to express a word of caution, and, and that is that we must always remember that we are working with biological products and we are working with food products. And we are sitting in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis. And the COVID-19 crisis has been is the result of the transmission of pathogens from animals to people. That is where this crisis comes from. Um, so whatever we do, we must be very, we, we must recognize the environment we are working with. If we are working in the brewing environment or distilling environment, remember that the yeast that you put in there, the things that starts brewing, it may not always be good. And we actually have seen some cases in South Africa where people died as a result of home brews. Um, what we should also remember that when you start distilling, um, there are different types of alcohol. We've got ethanol and methanol and all those sort of things. Some of these alcohols are actually uh, a deadly dangerous to people. So if you don't get the distilling process correct and the brewing process correct, then in the end, you may end up with a, 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 a real life hazard in, in the process. In terms of, I'm not quite sure if I got the question correctly from uh, Member Bartman in terms of how is the alcohol lockdown eating into other, other alcohol markets? I think probably she, the reference is here to the tourism market and things like that. And definitely, 
it is a major problem. I think if we look at the average wine farm, um, we know that about 50% of the wine products in, uh, of wine in South Africa are being exported. However, the opposite is that 50% of the product is sold on the domestic market and the domestic market is still closed. So it has got a major impact on, uh, on wine producers and the whole tourism, the wine tourism market is closed. So yes, there, there is a serious impact on, uh, on agriculture from this lockdown on, on alcohol. Uh, Chairperson, if, uh, if there's any f uh, more clarification, I can come back later on that one. Thank you. Sorry, Chair, if I can come in first and then Aisha can just uh, speak to it after. Uh, uh, is that Mr. Uh, 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 yes, that's Mr. Jacob it, speaking? Yes, it's me speaking. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think just in terms of you know, extent of coverage in a disaster. We are uh, guided by the, the natural disaster, uh, national disaster scheme framework, which admittedly is still a draft document, but it's been a draft document over many years now from, from national. But in terms of that, the only support that we can provide is in respect of livestock. So it's about a, a matter of life and death. So if uh, there's no support provided, effectively the animal will die. And, and so we, uh, in terms of that disaster framework, we are not able, allowed to um, provide any financial support to, to crops or anything like that. Uh, and so that's the very real limitation. And so Memaran is correct, but it is just uh, farmers who um, have got livestock farms that are required to um, or that will be able to qualify for drought support uh, as uh, by way of a national disaster. Thank you very much, Chair. I don't think Aisha wants to add anything further before we hand over to somebody else. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just Thank you, add the fact. Thank you. I'll just add that Part of the support to um, livestock farmers and particularly livestock farmers who graze on natural felt. It is like um, DDG said, it's about um, life, but it's also to protect the natural environment. So at the moment, there's no natural felt for those animals to graze on. And that's part of the reason we're supporting um, livestock farmers. And um, it's also supporting a economic uh, industry, a commodity, the red meat commodity um, industry at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Petsa. I can hear your microphone is on again. There was a question that Honorable Madam had asked around our tours and the fact that restaurants are closed. I want to ask the head of that the consider to respond to that. Chair, you the point of order? Honorable Maran? Chair, I, I wanted to interject earlier on when the when the HI, uh, HOD uh, was, was, was on the floor. Again, Chair, I can't hear a thing. There's some disturbance, and I'm not sure what it is, but on my side, I can't hear a thing what the HOD is saying. Neither yes, could I, Chair. Yes, you're correct. I think uh, HOD, Dr. Sebu Fetsa, there's a serious problem with your microphone. It seems like electronic noise that uh, is, is coming through, and I do hope that your IT department would be able to attend to that. Uh, do you, members, do you think it will help if he, try to speak, if he tries to speak again? Can you hear me now, Chair? Chairperson? Yes, Dr. Sebus Petsa. Can you hear me now? Yes. Let's try again. I was saying the question that Honorable Baron had asked, I would like um, Dr. Musiza to respond to immediately, please. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Doctor. Will you continue? Dr. Msiza can respond to the question around abatos. Thank you. Will, will our Chief Director Veterinary Services please come in? Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, am I audible? Yes, we hear you well. Okay, the, the program Veterinary Science has continued supporting the livestock industry through veterinary public officers, which were previously called meetings. <laughs> They render their services through the abattoir to ensure that the meat is is, is, is slaughtered safe and sound and, uh, uh, and so forth. But the, the halal party is, is handled by, uh, is in collaboration with the Muslim Judicial Council, which there's quite a lot of uh, processes that are involved. But Bongi has been fully involved in the halal component, which in itself is, is a project. I think he'll, he'll elaborate a little bit further on as far as the halal component. What is the department doing? But for the vet, the, for the abattoir part, our officials are doing, and so far we, we our, our abattoirs where we can, they are fully operational. And the issue of the abattoirs being, I mean, the restaurant is being closed. Bongi also can also help a little bit because that will affect the pricing, being the the, the, the steaks and all those things being not being sold through the abattoirs have a, an impact on the prices that the livestock owners have. But as far as the abattoir is concerned. The, the cattle come, we slaughter and make sure that it's, it's sent to the market fully healthy and uh, to make sure that it's wholesome. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Masia. Yes. Chair, I'm not sure whether this was a response on my question to the minister uh, when it comes to the provincial abattoir. I was not speaking about your normal abattoirs within your different districts who, who, who slaughters and there's then the halal part and so forth. I was just saying, Chair, uh, with the restaurants, restaurants that, that's been closed, there is not a high demand for steaks anymore. And I just wanted to check then with the minister, the provincial abattoir, is it still on track? Because I know it was one of his visions that there will be a provincial abattoir and that provincial abattoir will then uh, uh, target at your, your, the export market, specifically your, your Muslim, Muslim market uh, overseas. That was basically my question, just to check whether we are still on track in terms of the provincial abattoir for the export market. It seems that question was asked of the MEC. Will you come in, Dr. Meyer, please? We do hear you, but you are more fine than previously. Yeah, difficult to hear. Oh, there's a problem. Can, can I just ask doc, Dr. Sebu Petsa, you will have to just mute your microphone as it causes a lot of background electronic noise. Thank you for doing that. Minister Mayer, let's try again. Uh, yes, uh, Chair, I think I'm going to also start where I was cut off on the issue of Mr. Peter Mare, Honorable Member Mare. I think uh, he has asked some questions about the list of the maturity, the successful farmers. I think Dr. Sepopeche did answer that question. He wants a list, certainly we can provide the list of so successful people that will help through Casidra. I think that list is uh, possible. Honorable Member Maran spoke also about the issue of farm workers, food security, and the issue of uh, people going hungry. I think we have seen some of the research uh, that was done that indicates that those people that go largely hungry uh, in the Western Cape are mainly in the Cape metropolitan area. In the rural areas, there's also poverty, but hung and also go hunger, but the percentage is much significantly lower. And I think one of the things that we are seeing, and we have been also uh, met with the agricultural sector, together with some of the district mayors, to support the food banks in terms of food relief during this particular period. We have also asked them to use our flyover project and the flyover data project on our website so that they can use that site to indicate which uh, commodities and uh, different types of vegetables is on which route, where are the pack houses, where is cold storage, 
so that it can be transported uh, to the various particular sites. So I think the agricultural sector, both the commercial agricultural sector, as well as the small scale farmers have been significant contributing to food banks across the Western Cape. And I'm particularly happy. What I hear Honorable Member Maran says is that he, he hoped that we can continue with this approach beyond uh, COVID-19. I foresee that COVID-19 will have a longer impact than simply just a couple of months. And certainly this is something that we can certainly consider. Obviously, I think the agricultural sector is very uh, ha happy to continue with this. Obviously, we would also like to support uh, the NGO sector to, rather to provide the agricultural uh, products to a central center from there onwards distribution to the NGO network so that they can actually do uh, the work in the various communities. Uh, the issue of livestock, I think the colleagues have answered that. I personally, on the site of Honorable Member Maran, I think the current regulatory framework, I think they have to change it. We are pushing for that. I think uh, different people uh, have experienced need as a result of the drought. It does not only affect people in having livestock, it also affects people in orchards and other sectors of the agricultural value chain. So I'm on his side with that, but I do think with the limited money that's currently available for this, I do not see that we're going to make any headway soon on that particular matter. But on the issue of principle, I'm on his side. I think, Honorable Member Deirdre, uh, please invite me after lockdown for your homemade uh, pineapple beer. I can hear somebody is making pineapple beer. But I, I think on a more strategic level, what we are seeing is definitely two things. And innovation, and we have at Altenburg uh, in agricultural uh, agro-processing hub, where there are people that are helping people with innovation in agro-processing. So anybody that has an idea, they can test the idea, they can do the testing there, uh, all the scientific tests, and certainly if there's a market, they can even develop a label there and assist people with such innovative ideas obviously complying with all the food and health and safety regulatory framework and then testing the market. And we are definitely open for a free market economy, definitely open for agro-processing, definitely open uh, for the youth to get involved in innovative uh, practices. We've heard Dr. Trotsky speaking about the craft beers and the gin. We see it all over the Western Cape, all of these uh, innovative ideas. And I think there might be some big markets uh, on this. Well, the issue then, uh, Honorable Member Maran, uh, we have indicated that given the fact that the most Muslim people in South Africa are based in the Western Cape, given the fact that the biggest Muslim country in the world, 260 million people, are living in Indonesia and we have a regular contact and relationship for both Indonesia but also with the Middle East. So our idea is not to build our own halal agriculture uh, abattoir. We believe in the free market. And so we have invited, and they were here, I uh, think earlier, later last year from Qatar, from the vets from Qatar and our, our uh, veterinary services together with our economic services have met with our colleagues from Qatar who's interested in some of our halal export products. So they have visited uh, halal EU certified export uh, halal uh, abattoirs, particularly in the Marmesbury region, as well as in uh, here by Tol uh, not Tolbach, here by uh, Gouda in that particular region. So the idea is to position the Western Cape for the global ag agricultural uh, halal global market, specifically increasing our current one percent. Uh, global market access to about 2%. So that's what our purpose is. So the idea is never to build a state abattoir. I think if there was such an understanding, then I apologize. It may be a misunderstanding, but I take the uh, all the responsibility for that. But the idea is that we position the Western Cape with global agriculture, halal, export certified industries in the halal abattoir business so that we can 
increase our global market from 1% to 2%. And given where we are currently in, in the world with COVID-19 in the Middle East, and remember there was also a still a very long uh, civil war uh, in Syria, we foresee that our Western Cape and South Africa is ideally positioned to serve that global market, and we will continue to do so. We have, uh, as I said, taken our colleagues from the Middle East to EU certified halal uh, export abattoirs here in the Western Cape. Chair, I think that's uh, many of the questions that we have uh, answered. Uh, if there are any, I'm quite happy to do that. But I think there's a lot of goodwill from both commercial and small scale farmers to assist people during this difficult period with food relief. And I think uh, what we're trying to do now is to do it on a more structured basis. And I'm thankful for both Agri Western Cape as well as AFASA for the big contributions that they've made here in the Western Cape. Thank you, Chair. Thank Speaker, you very much, Freedom Front. Member Murray, you're welcome. And then also I see the hand of Honorable Bartman. Thank you very much. I just want some answers on some very important issues. Uh, the the, the Casidra has put forward certain strategic goals. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven goals. I want to know how they intend achieving those goals with the limited resources and nothing really is positive at this stage. I want to know, first of all, they say in their goal five, they will continually try to become a high-performance team excelling in project excellence. Human capital development of their own staff, they say, is needed. They say they need effective knowledge management systems. They also say in, in their goals, that they need ongoing support for agri-schools. They also talk of an exit strategy for Amalistain, Zua and Weikrau in Düsseldorf. How will they deliver on poverty eradication? They haven't told us. How will they deliver on job creation, the green economy and the rural development? The, 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 the document which I've seen is an academic exercise. It, it is really not a practical thing because they don't have the money, they don't have the capacity, but they promise all these things. I want answers, sir, how they intend doing it. They're even giving back money except the conditional grants. So if they only uh, is going to retain the conditional grants and everything else, they say, no, they will surrender. Where are they going to get the money to achieve all the objectives? And why do they only start training their staff now? Thank you, and Honorable Bartman. Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, just a side note, I'm actually allergic to beer. So if Minister Mayor comes and visits me, unfortunately, there will be no pineapple beer in this household. Um, <laughs> secondly, um, I do thank you for for encouraging open opportunities in our economy. And thank you for indicating regarding the responsibility in, in <coughs> brewing beer, especially because in our rural areas, we'll find that there may be youth or gogos who could be empowered to supply stores with homemade, safe, responsible brewed pineapple beer. And I just wanted to make a suggestion that perhaps even as a campaign, as part of the Western Cape government, perhaps helping entrepreneurs with pineapple beer, that we even ask those entrepreneurs to put on their beer to show to customers that this is brewed responsibly, perhaps. But that is just a suggestion. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Bartman. Uh, if you would allow me, and uh, also on this lighter note of uh, the alcohol ban, well, firstly, uh, I think Elsenberg must come up with a recipe that uses uh, more Western Cape uh, kind of products for for the brewing of, of beer. Pineapples is not that big here in the, in the Western Cape. I think it falls under the category that Dr. Trotsky mentioned, like maize, etc., that uh, that flourishes better in uh, in a summer rainfall area, as far as I know. But on a, on a more serious note, could I just ask uh, first, um, we are spending Western Cape money or we've budgeted money to spend 
on, for example, the canal system uh, below the Clan William Dam, the uh, money that we give to Lorwa, which I believe is absolutely necessary. Uh, all reports are that uh, the canal system is, is dilapidated, it's very old, it's in serious need of maintenance, and the effect of a breaking of the canal wall is extremely serious, as we have seen in, in the past. Now, my question is just, is there any chance of recovering the expenses? Because we are spending provincial money on what is officially a national asset. Because the, the understanding that I have is that that infrastructure is actually the responsibility of the National Department of, of Water Affairs. And then secondly, we've had a public uh, promise from the Minister of uh, Water Affairs uh, last year that the National Department would contribute to the raising of the canal wall for the Brandfly Dam. Where, uh, that after the Western Cape and partic uh, particularly uh, uh, our Premier in his previous capacity when he was responsible for economic development and I think agriculture was combined then, that all the necessary permissions were obtained, that the design work has been done, etc. Et and, and, and then the province did not spend, and my impression is that spending on that project would unlock enormous agricultural potential. Uh, vast tracts of land would now become uh, uh, arable, and also it gives a huge opportunity to uh, developing farmers. And now it seems as if for the second year round, that project has been jeopardized, it's postponed, and it means that in this country where we in dire need of job creation, economic growth, and especially now with the uh, economy and, and the need for economic recovery, that, that in this tussle between uh, national and provincial, that we are actually shooting ourselves in the foot, that, uh, that, this, that this potential is not being unlocked. And, um, and I'm, I'm just wondering whether we are engaging with the National Department of Water Affairs in, in this regard. And then lastly, a number of the lockdown regulations have affected the Western Cape, I think, more severely, and particularly our agricultural sector, together with the tourism sector, more severely than many of our, our sister provinces. And I'm just asking, uh, to what extent do you liaise with the National Command Center, wherever is uh, responsible, for the regulations in terms of the different uh, lockdown levels to to protect our tobacco farmers, to protect particularly our liquor industry, uh, because I'm concerned that the Western Cape's economy, with our reliance on tourism and agriculture as our two major uh, uh, sectors, that our economy is uh, would 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 be even hit harder than many of the others, you know, the, the mines are starting to reopen, etc. But yet, you know, there's still this, this complete ban on, on liquor sales, on cigarette sales, etc. Et, et so if, if you could just help us, are you, are you making input? Are you liaising with uh, those responsible for these decisions? And before you respond, I see there are two hands, Honorable Maran and then Honorable Maseku. If, if those members, uh, I hope that would perhaps be our last round uh, of questions. Uh, Honorable Maran, would you like to go first? Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chair. Chair, uh, to the uh, Minister, uh, apology accepted uh, on the issue of the, because my understanding was that uh, the idea was to establish a provincial abattoir, but I clearly get the picture now, and uh, uh, that one is fine, Chair. The, the, the issue of, I just wanted to check because I'm not sure whether it was the CEO uh, during his presentation, have spoken about farms uh, that went unproductive. Uh, 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 if it's one, maybe it's fine, but if it becomes more and more, it becomes a real problem in terms of food security, whether it is in, is in the country or in the province. Now, the issue of drought support here, and, and clearly the answer is the same as last time. It's, it's only for the natural grazing, for those livestock farmers, uh, 
and and and, and those and the crop farmers chair. I mean, a poor person will choose either crops versus meat. Uh, but also, say, uh, and, and I'm not sure the MECF said it will be a difficult task to change that particular uh, issue over the, over the next few months or, or even some time to come, uh, also to deal with that particular issue. Whether the, 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 the department can present us with a report, whether the impact on crop farmers, uh, say, uh, uh, maybe on a later stage, so that we can see the impact that a drought have on those particular farmers, Chair. Uh, then, Chair, um, also, um, the, the, the last one, Chair, the, on, on page 42 of one of the presentations, the agri-worker competition, and Minister, if you can recall, uh, I think it was a couple of days after the agri-worker uh, competition that we had at the work and Pal, or I'm not sure when it was that same evening, I had a discussion with you saying that those uh, 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 workers who won that prestige uh, competition, they remain either farm worker or a farm manager, yet they don't progress. And what's the possibility then to say that part of the winning prize uh, like the department of, of the national department of, of, of rural development, the one hectare per family. What's the possibility of, of as part of the price, provide that winner with a one hectare uh, a chair? And the minister at that stage have said that we might look into that possibility. But according to this presentation now, there's a big possibility that that prestige award will not take place this particular year. And maybe it give us some time to go and, and, and think over whether it's uh, the, the one actor is a possibility, Chair, uh, uh, and so that whoever won that prestige award there can also become a, a, a land over, whether it's one or two actors. But for this year, Chair, we accept it seems that the prestige award will not continue this year. Lastly, Chair, the Minister, have said that the issue of, 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 of the, the, the food support for those who I need and also the food banks, I will appreciate that if that can be uh, ongoing beyond. We know that the lockdown is not going to end soon, we know that, but uh, if, it, if it can be an ongoing in, in, in farmers uh, supporting these food banks to make sure that, the, that those in need uh, don't go hungry. You know, a hungry person is, is, is immune system. Uh, he will not have powers to fight against this uh, disease called COVID-19. So that Thank we make you. sure that those people don't go hungry. Thanks. Thank you, Honorable Maran and Honorable Maseku. And we give the last word to you. Thank you very much, Chair. And I just want to just say one question. When we had a presentation in Glen William, the Department of Water Affairs said there's going to be about 20%, if I'm not wrong, that is going to be allocated, and it was mandatory, that is going to be allocated to the historically disadvantaged individuals. Now, I just want to find out how far is that process? Is that department working with the Department of Agriculture, Western Cape, to make sure that the rightfully individuals that has to benefit are the ones that are benefiting from that and what is the process that that department doing to make sure that they make the department of agriculture to be involved in that allocation of the water services thank you chair thank you honorable maseku and uh, honorable minister would you lead the, yes. the response Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to those uh, honourable members for the questions. I think I see I'm done, Chair. Did you hear me? Uh, what I heard was that that you were done, and that the responses can con can 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 be uh, given now. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think the uh, question about Casidra about achieving their goals. I think that question uh, can be answered by Cassidra from Honourable Member uh, Marais about how do they achieve their goals, what they are doing. I think let's uh, give them an opportunity to uh, fully express themselves on that question. 
Honorable uh, Chair, I think there was a question. I think it come, came from you about how does this Western Cape government and particularly the Department of Agriculture engage with the National Command Center in terms of these regulatory frameworks? Well, there are different levels. Firstly, every morning uh, we are meeting at the prof joints to determine what are the various issues coming up from transport to logistics, to health, to agriculture, any issue that has emerged overnight or problems that we receive either WhatsApp or cell phone messages or even through the uh, emails and other platforms or even through our provincial uh, COVID-19 hotline number. We take all these issues. Every morning it goes to the prof joints where all the various stakeholders dealing with this issue in, in the context of the whole of government approach, they go into that and from that center, we lies with the National Command Center. The second level of engagement chair is the premier. For example, the Saturday, he met with the president and the other nine or other eight premiers through the president coordinating council. The cabinet normally asks him to also raise some of those issues to the president coordinating council. The president then undertake at that level to take these matters to the national command center. The third level of engagement chair is the Premier also on a regular basis, uh, on a telephone basis, contact the uh, president and they have a good relationship in this particular regard. And the president always uh, come back to him in terms of these issues. But in addition to this, uh, all the various MECs, we also lies directly with our MECs. For example, I have written a letter about the wine industry to uh, National Minister Toko de Desa, my counterpart, Minister of uh, Economic Development and Finance, also wrote a similar letter to the Minister of DTI. Uh, and so our colleagues also lies with the, our national counterparts in this particular regard. Uh, also, the various sectors, in particular, I know that Dr. Sebo Petsa also engaged with the National Department of Agriculture and also lies and link this back into the uh, command center. The, Minister of Agriculture nationally has now called for a MINMEC meeting. And we see has also established a, a MINMEC WhatsApp group. And all of the discussions there also feed back into the uh, command center. So we use all of these opportunities. But I must say that also greatly thankful for my HOD, Dr. Sebo Petscher and his senior managers who also lies uh, directly with the national departments, as well as the various uh, sectors, uh, the commodities, uh, sectors here in the Western Cape, because I think sometimes we achieve more uh, also through uh, the official line. So we are very thankful for, for that and Dr. Sepo Petsch's way of dealing with these issues. Yes, uh, I heard uh, Honorable Member Maran is asking what is the impact of drought on crops and farmers? I certainly think the economists, uh, maybe uh, the colleagues can answer that question. The issue, I think, uh, Chair, of Honorable Member uh, Bartman. Uh, it's also a very important question. The approach that the Western Cape Department of Agriculture follows in terms of any new idea, and I mean new ideas came now from this portfolio of standing committee. What we normally do, we then put it into the research space. We do some research first, test it with the industry, pilot it, go into the agri-processing, pilot the stuff there, see if there's a market, and then we'll step back and let the market continue it. But we will support and embrace all innovation. But everything must be evidence-based, research-led, so that we make sure that we also protect all other industries. But I think the point is well taken, and it's a great idea that came from this uh, standing committee. Honorable member, uh, Maran also asked about the Western Cape Prestige Agri Forum. Yes, I remember very well. Last year, he did speak to me at the award ceremony at Niederberg. And I think what he is actually asking is, are we willing to consider broadening the criteria, uh, let's say, for the prices in terms of the Western Cape uh, Farm Workers uh, Forum? I'm going to leave this to my HOD. Uh, to refer this to him and to the committee, something that I could potentially consider. 
and I would like to hear his views on this. Honorable Member Maran, you are right. I think it's most likely we don't foresee that we may have a competition this year for our agri-workers, but I did indicate to my HOD that maybe we can have a different type of a format, and we are still considering this in terms of celebrating our farm workers. We could potentially take uh, the winners in the last two, five, ten years and let them each make a half minute video so that we celebrate them in a different format. We have made an infographic and distributed it on the 1st of May this year on Workers' Day to celebrate uh, our agri-workers in the Western Cape. But I do think there might be some different digital platforms to celebrate our agri-workers. The issue of food banks, uh, Chair, uh, we are meeting soon with the agricultural stakeholders here in the Western Cape. And through you, I'm now asking also my HOD to also uh, maybe put this item on the agenda when we have this discussion about a uh, future role of agricultural sector in the food security uh, issue. I think the question for Honorable Member Maseko, I leave that to the HOD. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Sebu Petsa, your microphone is unfortunately still giving trouble. If you speak loud and clear, perhaps we can hear you. Can you hear me now, Chair? We hear you over the noise. Please speak clearly Chair. and slowly. Chairperson, can you hear me now? We do hear you, but unfortunately the noise is still there, but we do hear you over the noise. Please speak loud and clearly. I apologize for this, and uh, our IT will have to attend to this immediately. Um, the question from Honorable Maseko around the 20% of water from the Clan William Dam, um, reserved for the previously disadvantaged farmers. I want to confirm that indeed there are uh, lines of communication between ourselves and the Department of Water Affairs and Sanitation, uh, but also that the whole idea will be driven largely by the Land Reform Department who do need to acquire land so that um, um, PDI farmers can be settled in that area. So it's a matter that uh, we continue to, to deal with with the National uh, Department. Chair, I hope, I hope I'm audible on that one. Thank you. Yes, we could follow you. And the Are second issue, yes. the second issue that Minister referred to me is it flows from the question of Honorable Meren. I do want to say that uh, I would like the team to engage on the extent to which we could uh, amend the criteria for the agri prestige. Uh, and obviously we'll keep the committee informed uh, going forward as to uh, what happens out of that uh, uh, discussion. I do think the point is indeed well made. Uh, we may need to um, engage the department that deals with land acquisition or possibly our public works here uh, to ensure that uh, uh, indeed the winners are assisted. We will, uh, would like to come back to the committee on this one with a, with a report at some point. The third issue that was raised was around the Glen William Dam and was raised by yourself, Chair, and Lord Bois. And I want to immediately ask uh, Dr. Trotsky uh, to just respond high level in terms of uh, uh, what is happening in that space. Suffice to say, Chair, that the opportunity that these two dams provide for our sector is bigger than the challenges that we're dealing with. And this matter was raised um, last week in our discussions with the national department that is currently putting together a plan that is called um, Agriculture Agri-Processing Master Plan. We have registered uh, very clearly the fact that uh, the two dams are actually low-hanging fruits for our sector, but I would like uh, Dr. Trotsky to respond to that chairperson. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Is it Dr. Trotsky that's going to respond? Uh, Chairperson, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, just in brief, I, I think what we must remember is that in, in the well, uh, this dams and the canal surrounding that is the property of national government and the Department of Housing of, of Human Settlements, Water and Sanitation owns that property. So we cannot just uh, start construction and, and building and things like that. So the previous year, uh, we uh, the money was made available and the intention was uh, to use that money and make it available to the uh, 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 Breda Fallet Water Users Association that maintains that infrastructure to do that as part of their, their maintenance. Um, However, the water and sanitation has indicated at that stage that they will do the construction as part of the normal maintenance uh, process. So for that reason, uh, we said, OK, let water and sanitation do that. And also, uh, 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 linked to your question earlier, what is national mandate and what should provincial money be used for? Uh, so we left that to, uh, to water and sanitation. Um, and the intention or the intention was to do this via the current summer month. So on the 14th of February 2020, the Premier of the Western Cape Province wrote a letter to Minister uh, Susulu and asked what the intention is, are construction still going to take place, etc. Uh, and I know the letter was sent. I don't know whether the Premier's office has received a, a response to this particular letter. Uh, the only thing I can think is that perhaps as a result of COVID-19, uh, when construction was halted, there was also a, a halt on, on this particular project. So, so that is where it stands. Um, and we, uh, we, we are still waiting for an answer from the National Department on, on this particular question. Uh, but as the HOD has indicated, we have again uh, made sure that this particular or the, these projects are part of the bigger uh, picture and also on national's agenda in, in the process. Thank you, Dr. Trotsky. Anybody else that would like to respond still or any members that believe that their questions have not been responded to? Yes, sir. I think Cassidra ignores me and it won't help them. Thank you, Honorable Murray. My impression is that uh, you will not let go of them. Uh, they, they're getting a reprieve because we on Skype, but we, there will come a time when the house will sit. So I think they owe an answer to the people listening in on YouTube and over, over the social media. So they mustn't feel safe. I want answers to the questions. Who mark your score sheet? And how are you going to implement without money all the promises in your presentation? Thank you. I see two hands, that of Dr. Sebu Petsa, as well as that of uh, Mr. Frederik van Seil. Uh, which one of you would like to go first, please? Ja, I, wanted yeah. to, I, I wanted to say exactly that, that we should have. please allow uh, Kassibra to, uh, to respond. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Fonsal. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. I think the part that was maybe could have been interpreted as uh, moaning and groaning comes from the spot analysis that we did. On the one side, we mentioned the weaknesses, that is so. But on the positive side, we also mentioned the strengths. Um, and there are things as long-standing relationships with the shareholder, capacity that had been built, and um, all of that. Just back to the process again, we consider constantly liaise with departments and we are invited to their planning sessions as well. Following that, the managers are then compiling, coming back to the office and now they are compiling the, the strat plan for Casidra. After a, a, the approval by the management uh, component, it goes to the board, to the board of directors, which is the accounting authority. Then uh, we start reporting against that, and it's been audited by the Auditor General, and annually we table our annual report at the standing committees 
um, and also the public accounts committee where where we uh, um, are accountable and where we do our explanations and everything. And then also when it goes to the risk and uh, the risk that we've mentioned, on the right hand side of the risk, we also put the mitigating actions that is uh, that, that's in process as well. That is as far as the process is concerned. And yes, annually we appear in front of the committees for and we do answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van Sale. And I think, uh, Honorable Marie, we must acknowledge that both those farms are in the Klein Karua and that the Klein Karua is still gripped uh, in the severest drought that uh, they've experienced for many, many years. I know of uh, farms that have been farmed for generations that are currently really, really struggling uh, as, as previous generations have never experienced something similar to this. Thank you very much, honourable members. I uh, would like us to move on to the administrative part of our meeting. Uh, and therefore, can I say from my side, honourable minister, thank you very much for your engagement, for being uh, part of our meeting and responding uh, on numerous occasions to uh, comments and, and questions. Then also to Dr. Sebu Petsa, uh, thank you very much. and. We do know that, as I've just referred to the drought, uh, we've referred to the COVID-19 lockdown and the effect, and particularly the reprioritization of budget allocations, which I believe is going to hit all government departments. Uh, we wish you well. We wish you wisdom going forward. And uh, as you will be reporting on a quarterly basis uh, regarding your achievements, uh, both you and Casidra. I think uh, I can assure the members that this will not be the last opportunity to engage with you and also engage with you regarding the challenges that uh, you're experiencing. I want to say from my side, thank you very much. Thank you to each and every one who, who presented, but also for those that have attended this and especially for the members of the public who have taken an interest and who has followed us uh, in this meeting. Thank you very much for your for your uh, interest in in what the Department of Agriculture in the Western Cape is doing. I wish you well, uh, members. I'm going to allow for a five minute break just quickly before we go over to resolutions and also the uh, the consideration of the minutes of the last meeting. So those of you that would like to uh, uh, sign off, you're welcome. I'm just asking members to please rem remain online. Uh, for some five minutes in, 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 on my watch, it's now uh, 20 to 4. If I could ask that we rejoin at uh, quarter to 4, please don't uh, sign out with your computers. Uh, you can just mute your microphone and your, and your uh, video, and uh, then we'll see each other in five minutes again. Thank you so much.
the uh, all members are still with us, so thank you very much for that. Can I just quickly ask, are there any resolutions that you believe should flow from the presentations and the question and answer session? Speaker, may I address you? Yes, thank you, Honourable Marie. You're welcome. I have not, I have not formulated a resolution. I want first want to hear what the other members say. But I didn't get any answers. They talk about an exit strategy for Malistain, Zuar, and Vaikra. They didn't say how. They they, they they haven't told us how they will deliver on poverty eradication. They didn't say what they're going to do for job creation, the green economy, and the rural development in the light of COVID-19, in the light of them admitting that they have short supply in terms of infrastructure, they, ha they have no money, they haven't trained staff. They say one of their goals is to sharp the, sh the saw continually to become a high-performance team. They still want to become a high-performance team. Th that means they're not one yet. Uh, excelling in project excellence human capital development of its own. And they need staff, they say. They must train their staff. They must train their staff in terms of knowledge management systems and ongoing support for agri-schools. All these luckily are found in their report, which we normally get a day before the ca we sit in Parliament. This time I got it a few days before the time, and I read through it. They've been boozling us. I would like to know what are we going to do about it? How sustainable is Cassidra? How sustainable are they? Are we wasting money? And, and, and we don't see any black or colored farmers having been successfully empowered who can also put their goods onto the, uh, uh, onto the market, onto the, uh, become commercial farmers? We, we were them now since 2007. It's now 2020. And every year we get the same reports. So I want to know, is this committee prepared to take a firm stand? And I know that some of you might not agree with me. I will take this fight on other platforms. If, if, if we can't see, Cassidra sit on our own. Every time when the over school is, and they can not for us say any success for all of I want stories of successes which we can hang on to the wall and say, look at this, what we've achieved in terms of empowering colored or black or Indian farmers. Look at our record. We've got nothing to show. And I would like to know whether we forget about party affiliations now. Let's look at the, the, the future of emerging farmers. What can we do in terms of a resolution to apply pressure on them? They must be evaluated by a third independent party. The Auditor General is not there to, to measure their competencies. They're just there to see whether the money is fine. But their Thank successes, you. that's yes. what I want to address. Yes. Thank you, Honorable Marie. I see the hand of Honorable Bartman. Thank you. I just wanted to find out if Honorable Marie has a resolution, and if so, what exactly is that resolution? Because as a committee, we're going to have to consider it. Um, it was wonderful hearing the context of what such a resolution may or may not be, but I just want to know exactly what are we agreeing to here? Uh, Jefferson? Thank you. I Chair. Also saw, I also saw Honorable uh, Maran Maseko. waving at me and then Honorable Maseku. Maseko first for a change. You're welcome. Uh, Honorable you, Maran Chair. has indicated before that ladies, he will always stand back for a lady. I know that. I respect him for that, Chair. Chair, I just want you to maybe highlight one thing. Cassidra. It implements the projects for the Department of Agriculture. Now, if there is a shortfall from the site of Cassidra, we have to start in the department itself on the APP and there are strategic plans of where is the shortfall. 
we can start at the Casedra. Now, I want to hear from Member Mare that where does he see the shortfalls when he connects the doors to the Department of Agriculture for those projects that the Department of Agriculture said Casedra have to implement for them? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, and Honorable Maran. Chair, thanks. Look, Chair, on the issue that uh, Honorable Maria raised, and we have raised this issue last year where some of the departments surrender huge amounts of money to Treasury or to the Premier's Fund. And if I'm not mistaken, Casidra was one of those. And now suddenly there's a shortfall. Thought for, thought for. But be as it may, Chair, on the two farms, and, and, and I want to understand the Honorable Maria correctly. On the two farms, as I understand, and I, if I look at the reports, uh, the uh, the one in Dasselsdorf. Say, are you there? I'm here. I'm listening. The one of Dasselsdorf, and maybe we should get time frames from Krasidra. To my understanding, they are in the process to hand over that particular. The moment as it comes profitable, wants to hand it over to a community entity within Dasel's door. Maybe we should get time frames from then. When will it happen? Also, when it comes to the, 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 the other farm uh, in, the, in uh, what is the other farm's name, Chair? Amalienstein. Amalienstein. And what is the other one? Amalienstein the, 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 and Zuar. Yeah, Amalienstein. Vaikra. Chair is the one that we have visited. The one basically where is that where there's nothing going on on that particular farm. Remember, we have visited yes. that farm, I think, in, in February. Yes. And yes. at yes. that yes. stage, yeah, and I remember, Chair, I was one of those who sat throughout the engagement with Casidra in that small room yes. over there. Yes. And, and they, they told us they are, they are busy with discussions with the Department of Land Reform and the Rural Development. Uh, as part of the exit strategy, strategy in an attempt to give it back to the department. And I'm not sure whether it's still the plan, but that's what they told us at that particular point in time. Now, I'm not sure, Chair, whether they want to do the, the, the same in, uh, in, uh, in Malstein, in Dasselsdorf, whether they want to get it to a, 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 a profitable uh, entity or, or what their exit strategy is in terms of that particular farm. But when it comes to the one in Dasselsdorf, they want to hand it over to a, a community entity as per the report. That's what I, I pick up in that report, uh, Chair. Thanks. Thank you. Honourable members, no, I, I think Honourable Marie is, is onto something very serious. I think we need to, to get a report as to the uh, financial and economic viability of both those farms. Information that independent people, farmers in, the, in, in, in that vicinity, has shared with me, has said that, for example, the Vikral has never been a flourishing farm. That, you know, even when it was only a, a farmer and his wife uh, farming that farm, that, you know, water was always a problem and that, uh, you know, obviously it's been ex exacerbated by the current drought. And in the case of Amalienstein, Amalienstein used to get water from the Sieverbeek's Poort River, but now uh, that farm has to divert some of its water to the quite considerable number of uh, low-cost houses, RDP houses that have been built also on uh, part of, of Amalienstein land. And obviously, you know, water for human consumption gets preference before agriculture. So in both these cases, I think that, and that's the questions that I hear you're asking, is that, you know, is there a prospect or is this like an albatross around the province's neck and that, you know, we will keep on pumping water into those schemes and that we, they will never be, you know, the dreams of the communities have been shattered and that the possibility is there. And, and it seems to me there are some serious signs showing that, you know, this is uh, uh, no turnaround strategy. If you if you haven't got water, you can have the best turnaround strategy. So can I propose that as a resolution, we ask, uh, put, put a question 
and I think it's eventually going to be a political question, so probably the question will have to be put to the uh, MEC to say, please inform us whether you believe that there is a realistic expectation of uh, either of these farms to become uh, an economically viable entity. Uh, is, is that a resolution of this committee that, that, that we ask of the MEC to, to, to look at the uh, business plans, to look at the future? Uh, I think we must be honest with those communities. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not the kind of politician that would like uh, to, to, to create false expectations from, from communities or, or in communities. So would, would that be, Honorable Marie, in line with what you... Um, what you proposed, uh, I, I quickly uh, saw Honorable Maseko's hand going up and down. So perhaps Honorable Marie, would you like to respond first? Yes, Chairman, thank you. I think that what's needed, and I note uh, a mem Honorable Member spoke of the MEC must get involved. I agree to that. And I would say that we as a committee request that the MEC for Agriculture establish uh, a, a committee to monitor and track performance, the performance of Casida in areas on a regular basis to determine the sustainability of it and customer satisfaction in handovers. Because we haven't even asked those people who they've now handed over farms, how do you find this handover? Are you happy? Does it work? Uh, 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 I, I, did you get what you expected to get? How are you operating? Now, there's no monitoring. They monitor themselves. And although I'm not an expert, I've never been uh, concerning myself with growing up of resolutions. But I think that we should, in the resolution, say that the minister must establish a committee that will, on a continuous basis, monitor and track key performance areas uh, where Casidra is involved to determine the sustainability and the level of customer satisfaction. Thank you. Honorable Mbere, can I just ask, uh, thank you for that input. Uh, so it seems to me we agree that we need to get, uh, and if needed, uh, independent uh, report on the viability of both Vikral and Amalienstein, because those are still with, with Casidra or with the department. Can we just, before we move on to the previous schemes and the list of emerging farmers, is, is, would that be a resolution? I see Honorable Bartman's hand, and I also saw Honorable Maran waving at me, Honorable Bartman. Can we Thank first just you. deal with, with, with Vikral and Amalienstein before we move off that topic? Yes, Chair. Chair, I was yes. just going to say I agree with your proposal that we get the the financial documentation and a report um, regarding that matter. But just regards to creating a committee, an extra committee, I don't think that that would be viable because we are the agricultural committee. And as the agricultural committee, part of our mandate is to do oversight over the department, which includes its entity, which is Casidra. So if there are specific places that we eventually do have to go see or need to go see, particularly this year, for example, after lockdown or whenever we are allowed to physically go and see and do oversight, then that should be part of our program. Um, and where we should go should then be put forward to say, OK, we want to go see A, B and C. Because where would this other Chair, committee be formed? Chair, you look up nice to me before. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Bartman, for that. Uh, Honorable Maseku, also still on the same subject. Honorable Maseku, you want to speak on the same subject? I think you're breaking up. Honorable Maseku, I can see you. you, you trying to speak, but you're muted at present. Speaker, well, uh, Honorable Maseko is struggling with the mic. Can I'm I not respond struggling, to Chair. Okay, sorry. Uh, Honorable Marie, just give her an opportunity to come in, please. Chair, I just wanted the, the, the clarity from the procedural officer.
because on the visit report, these farms also, I think there is a resolution that we have taken of what is it that we are going to do. Can we get a clarity from her of what were the resolutions there so that we don't replicate the same thing that is on the cluster B visit week and this one so that we choose one, which one are we going yes. to, to do? Yes, valid point. Can I just ask, is your procedural officer back with us? Because she did indicate via um, WhatsApp that at one stage she's- uh, Did you hear me, Chair? Yes. I did, yes. I did. I yes. am here, she, um, connected for now. Um, Member Maseko, when we look at our tracking document, I think the resolutions, and I stand to be corrected, was that the Standing Committee on Agriculture would liaise with the Department of Agriculture, with um, CASIDRA, as well as the Department of Transport and Public Works around the viability of those farms. Okay. So, uh, uh, Honourable uh, Marais, it seems to me it yes. is on our agenda then already. Um, and uh, can we ask the procedural officer to prioritise that engagement as as as, as uh, a, a, a priority item for us. I see Honourable Maran. Can uh, Honourable Marie, Can we just quickly, if it's on this point, can we just quickly give Honourable Maran because he hasn't had an opportunity to to take part in the discussion. Uh, Honourable Maran, would you like to come in now on this on this yes. item, or is your hand up for uh, another item? Chair, no, no, no. It's for the same item, Chair. Uh, Look, Chair, uh, as I've said, what I've read in the reports, basically when it comes to the two different farms, basically what the exit strategy seems to be. The one is to hand it over to a community, the community within Dacel's Door. But listening from what you have said now, Chair, I would want to agree with the Honorable Mare, because that if you are saying, Chair, that you have even spoken to the farmer before and before and before, when it was only the wife and him, himself, the farm was not economically viable then. And I'm not even sure how Cassidra or the department arrives to build a dam for millions of rents on that particular farm. I'm not even sure, Chair. So, Chair, then I, it seems that I, that I would want to agree with the Honorable Marais, Chair, uh, that you can't just then for the sake of hand over or give a farm to people knowing very well you're going to set up that community or person or individuals up for failure. It can't be correct. You even said, Chair, when it comes to Manuel Stain, the farm uh, in Dacel's Door, uh, the, the, the human consumption, water and human consumption comes first. And, 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 and where last time when we have visited that particular farm, we received a presentation from Casidra where they have gone into agreement where they will provide water for the Dacelsdorf's community and in return they will get some of the uh, some of the, the fodder. So it seems Chair, that that farm might run also into difficulties if the circumstances is not viable. So Chair, on that then I would fully agree with the Honourable uh, that we ca cannot, we, con we, we, we can't continue as usual. And if it means that we have to establish, I don't think that we need to establish a new committee. I think the Honourable uh, uh, Badman is correct. We are there. We then, and, and, and uh, we're supposed to play that oversight role to make sure that we bring them on track, say, if they are out of line. Thanks. Thank you. I see the hands of Honourable Bartman as well as Honourable Maseku. I would appreciate it if one or both of you could present us with a proposed resolution to take this matter forward. Uh, Chair, sorry, I didn't know my hand was still up. I'll lower it now. I don't have anything okay. extra. Good. Thank you. Honourable Maseku, is your hand up again or is it still there, uh, from previous? Is your arm tired already? I speak if, if nobody else wants to. My last yeah. contribution. Uh, Honourable Marie, yes. Uh, I don't see Honourable Maseku unmuting herself. I wonder if she's got connection trouble. Uh, and I do see the hand of our, our procedural officer. Can I ask that, Honourable Marie, would you be able to try and formulate a, a resolution for this committee to take us forward, taking into account that apparently 
both these or the viability of both these farms is already on on our uh, tracking document. Uh, speaker, I want to. No, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, thank you. I want on the, to on the to we have a problem that it seems to me you're coming and going, and and I see your your you're muted uh, ninety percent of the time. Uh, let, can we quickly give Honorable Mare an opportunity, and then you you can respond to that if you're following Honorable Maseku? Honorable Mare, uh, I'm looking for a solution. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is uh, uh, Honorable Bartman says we are the oversight. Yes, but we're not technical oversight. We have a political oversight function. We don't know the technicalities of the proposals made by Cassidra, which is supposed to be professionals. We want an evaluation done so that we can can yes. do our oversight function from a basis of knowledge. Now, yes. if, if if I go there to Vikral or that, I know nothing about farming. I, I, I would like to know more about farming or what they've done, whether this is the best practice or not. I, I thought if we have a one or two persons that that is competent people that that is uh, uh, trained in farming methodology to give us their inputs and to say we visited Vikral, we visited uh, 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 um, Amali Stein, and our uh, uh, professional advice is the following: they are failing because of A, B, and C, or they need this or they need that. We don't know. We just accept whatever yeah. Cassidra tell us. Yes, thank you. Let's let's see if Honorable Maseko's connection is good now. Would you like to come in, Honorable Maseko? Uh, Chair, I was saying that there's no need for us to sort of discuss the merit of that topic we are going to discuss. Can we agree to put it on a um, agenda and prioritize it so that we can those merit those discussions can go on in that committee? Because I have to leave Chair in. 10 past four, if we can finish that, because already we are over thank our you. time. I thank you. You're correct. You're correct. OK, but I think our procedural officer, as uh, she's heard us, and she knows that we would, we, 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 we all, I think, on the same page. The question is just, you know, whether uh, we must do it as part of our oversight report or whether we as the committee must uh, prioritize this. And I think eventually it will be this committee that will have to get that independent evaluation of the situation. And 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 uh, if we can make that our resolution, uh, I would appreciate that. Can we move on? Is there any other matters that you would like to put in a resolution, honorable members? None. Thank you. Obviously, uh, you know, if, if there are more items, we would be able to deal with that uh, going forward. Then, honorable members, I would like you to just quickly ask our procedural officer if her connection is good, if she could quickly uh, pull up the minutes of the 5th of May 2020 as uh, uh, on our screens, because uh, I am putting these minutes to you for possible adoption. Okay, there we go, Chair. Thank you, Honourable Members. Can we quickly look at the, those set of minutes? Uh, yes, thank you, Ms. Nikerk. So there you have it. Uh, present at that meeting, the three full-time members from the DA, as well as uh, Honourable Maran from the ANC, Honourable Heron also attended, uh, and then Honourable Marais, uh, that's page one. Can we move on to page two? Thank you. And I think page three is almost just my signature, is it? Okay. Thank you, Honorable Maran. Uh, I think I, 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 I've gone through the minutes here. Yeah. Yes, and, and, and I can say it's a true reflection of the meeting. And thank, the you. thank you. Thank you. To chair, uh, if without uh, any time wasted, I want to 
opposed for, yes. to be accepted. Generally accepted, honorable members. Thank you. Done. Uh, then, uh, and it's proposed by Honorable Maran. Then the next one is our program going forward, Honorable Members. Um, our next meeting will be in two weeks from now. And I want to point out to you that is at present on Tuesday, the 2nd of June, uh, 10 o'clock. So it's again on a Tuesday, but not uh, 1 o'clock as we're used to. It's 10 o'clock uh, in the morning. And that is the joint meeting of the NCOP where they will be uh, deliberating or where the department will be informing us regarding the bill uh, on the uh, national forests. So, uh, so it will be the national forest amendment bill, 10 o'clock. It will be all provinces plus the members of the, or the, the committee of the NCOP. Uh, and that is a, a, a briefing uh, for us on that bill. And then a week later, on the 9th of June, again, 10 o'clock in the morning, we will be briefed on the National Environmental Management Laws Amendment Bill. So uh, please note that. But then once we've been uh, briefed on those two bills, we will have to take a position as the Western Cape on those bills and we will have to give a mandate. Um, sorry, Chair, may I address you? Yes, please do. Please go ahead, Honorable Maseku. I see you're muted here on my, on my side. I don't know, Honorable Maseku, if, you, if you've joined with two uh, sets of equipment, but uh, I, I heard your voice, but it shows you're muted here on, on, on the right hand side of my screen. Sir, I'll be leaving the meeting now with your uh, permission, sir. Yes, no, thank you. So you've, no, you've noted, uh, you've noted the, uh, the program going forward. So please, honorable members, thank you very much for your yeah. attendance. Yeah. Yeah. Honorable Maran, yes. Before you go, Chair, look, Chair, if you, for instance, look at this current week, uh, the, the meeting that we had this morning, the meeting that we now having, and again tomorrow we're going to have a uh, human settlement. Uh, and this morning's meeting, Chair, was a very long meeting. We have to deal with a couple of reports. The same in this particular meeting. Is it the only way that uh, the program authority Chair can schedule meetings like they have scheduled, scheduled for this for this week. I mean, all of us who are in this committee are basically the same in the other two committees also. Yes, Honourable Maran. Now, I I think your the point what you're saying is that it's been quite a demanding day. Uh, I think we must accept that you know. For, for now, it's, it's, I almost want to say a, it's a, a busy season uh, where we have to deal with these strategic plans and we're having the legislation coming up. I, I do foresee that we are going to go on to a four-week uh, recess uh, from the second week in June, from the 12th of, of June. And I think we will, we will have to uh, accept that our days will be quite full and and, uh, and, and long uh, for now. Hopefully it's going to ease up uh, soon. And, uh, and, and uh, my apologies if I haven't been able to manage the time better for us to finish at, at four o'clock. Our previous meeting Look, also ran over time quite considerably. So I, 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 I do understand that it's been a very difficult uh, uh, day for members. Honorable Maran. Okay. If, if that's the case, Chair, then I will all, then I will focus on uh, my committee where I am a member of the Zizaki Council. Sorry for the Honourable uh, Seyaku and the Honourable. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I, no I, I, I appreciate, I appreciate that Honourable Mara. Good. So, members, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, can I assume now that uh, our procedural uh, uh, organizer? will make sure that that resolution has been captured correctly. 
I trust. I trust that is the case. Thank you very much. And honourable members, I have to say thank you very much for your attendance, for your lively participation in this meeting. And a special word of thanks to those that made this meeting possible. Our procedural officer, as well as uh, uh, I think Ms. Morris and uh, Mr. Abbas from ICT. We appreciate uh, your support. And honourable members, we will then be meeting again as a committee, as I've said, some two weeks from now. And uh, I wish you luck and have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We'll meet again.